Hello, my name is Ashley Nelson, and I'm the Communications Director at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. And it is my great honor to welcome you today to Countering Revisionism, an international ga gathering of students, scholars, and allies who have come together to share their thoughts and insights into how to best engage new generations in combating historical revisionism and promoting inclusive histories around World War II heritage. This is no small task, <clears throat> nor one we in the heritage community can postpone. Around the world, there's a pronounced rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Asian hate, fueled in part by new media and communication technologies that manipulate historical facts and spread disinformation that perpetuates bias and discrimination. Heritage sites are increasingly and rightfully seen as a major contributor to sustainable growth and the social and economic well-being of local communities, as well as to their sense of identity. They, along with sites of conscience, which connect past uh, struggles to today's movements for social justice, are perfectly positioned to spark community dialogue that amplifies marginalized voices, assesses <clears throat> the damaging strands of revisionism, and promotes truth-telling, leveraging the lessons of the past to foster free, just, and democratic societies. Engaging youth around the world is essential to this mission. Without their firm understanding and leadership on these issues, the future remains ever vulnerable to misinformation and the violence that follows it. So it is with great enthusiasm that I welcome you here today to dive right into this problem and to start suggesting concrete solutions. Without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Dong Zhou Zhou, a professor um, at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University and one of today's key organizers. His research interests lie in international organizations, interstate conflict, and nuclear proliferation. And he is currently a board member for the Korean Association of International Studies, a member of the Council for the International uh, Political Science Association. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning. This Suhoj, President of E-commerce International Scientific Committee on Interpretation and Presentation of Cultural Heritage Sites, Ms. John Thompson, Professor of Journalism at Southern Illinois University, and President of the American Defenders of Bataan and College of Law Memorial Society, Ms. Patricia Odone, President of Our World Heritage, Mr. Zhang Rui Luxen, former Secretary of E-commerce, and today's presenters and board members of International Coalition of the Science of Conscience, young participants, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the two hosts, International Coalition of the Science of Conscience and Institute of you know, International Studies of Seoul National University, I'd like to welcome all of you to this seminar. My special gratitude goes to those who have traveled great distances to be here and young participants who submitted video presentations today. I'd like to share the background of this seminar with you. More than seven decades have already passed since the end of the World War II. It is regrettable some countries and people have not incorporated the lessons of World War II. The cause of war, which the Axis power promoted more than 80 years ago, still often utilized by the leaders of some countries and those who attempt to stop interstate conflict. Also, under the pretext of revisionism, there have been attempts to negate or deny the bare fact, bare-faced fact of the World War II. After reviewing this new development, the two hosts have reached a consensus. It is worthwhile to discuss interpretation practice in World War Heritage and engage with youth to listen to their experience in World, World War II Heritage. This seminar is an outcome of the cooperation between the two hosts. Two other organizations, International Scientific Com uh, Committee on Interpretation and 
presentation of cultural heritage site of the e-commerce and our world heritage shared these ideas and joined today's seminar. I expect all participants have an enriching experience today and I'm ready to listen to our outstanding pre uh, presentations and thank you. And now I would like to introduce Sue Hodges. Um, Sue is a historian from Melbourne, Australia, with extensive experience in the fields of history, heritage interpretation, sustainable tourism, capacity building, um, placemaking, and museum and exhibition development. Her business, SHP, operates in Australia and internationally. She is currently pres <coughs> the president of the ICOMOS International Scientific Committee on the interpretation and presentation of cultural heritage sites, and is a member of ICOMOS's advisory committee and an international expert member of the foundation, um, Romaldo Del Bianco. So I believe Sue will be. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? She's joining us virtually, so it may just take a yes, moment. Robin, <laughs> where it's 11.30 p.m. So, um, Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And on behalf of the, can you hear me? On behalf of the International um, Scientific Committee on the Interpretation and Presentation of Cultural Heritage Sites, I'm honoured to be here today and to join this very important conference. Uh, heritage interpretation has never been more crucial. As the opening remarks made clear, there are threats to the world at the moment from revisionism and also from a lack of critical thinking and a lack of really interrogating the past and understanding the importance of, um, of uh, re reimagining and rethinking how we approach World War II in particular. I'm very excited about this conference because it's examining multiple narratives and looking at contested histories and underrepresenting minorities. And it's particularly important that this conference focuses on inclusiveness and on the process of truth telling that will encourage shared understandings to be negotiated and truths to be revealed. But it will also engage new audiences with interpretation at heritage sites of all kinds and particularly sites of conscience. So um, in terms of representation, I'm sure all the papers here today will, will uncover different kinds of narratives that need to be told particularly focusing on stories that have been hidden or omitted and also the people who've been left out of World War II. And this in turn will encourage a new and revised understanding of the, the heritage sites of that era. So thank you very much for inviting us to participate and we're delighted to sponsor this event. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm honored to welcome Jan Thompson to the stage. Um, Jan Thompson is a professor and the director of the School of Journalism and Advertising at Southern Illinois University. Her research and professional work revolve around the American um, prisoner of war experience of the Imperial Japanese uh, during World War II. Her most recent professional work is the podcast Ben Steele, American, that is currently airing on iHeart, narrated by Alec Baldwin. Jan co-produced, wrote, and edited the series. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Joe, and uh, Seoul National University Institute of International Studies, and to the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience for inviting me to speak today about an important topic, how World War II is being taught, studied, and remembered. And I want to congratulate the attendees and those who are watching and showing an interest, because without you being interested in the truth about past events, I'm afraid that revisionism will win out. Revisionism can mean to change or adjust, or it can mean to erase, deny, or to distort. And I'm a documentary producer and have devoted pretty much my entire adult life of telling the story of the American POW of Imperial Japan during World War II. I am a daughter of a POW. That is my personal connection. 
My three documentaries on the POW experience have no historians or scholars. Why? Because I have primary sources. I used primary sources. Participants, survivors, victims. Another hat that I wear is that I'm a president of the organization, American Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor Memorial Society. I'll say that three times fast. In 2015, we were encouraged when the Japanese government promised to include in its UNESCO World Heritage Sites of the Meiji Industrial Revolution their full story. For the American POWs of Japan, that means including the history of their slave labor and abuse at many of the sites. As of today, however, Japan's written promise to include this full history has not been fulfilled. Nowhere in Japan is a state-funded memorial to any of Imperial Japan's war victims. My greatest wish is that Japan erect a world-class memorial on the dock of Moji in Japan. This is the entry port where most of the POWs that traveled on hell ships came to Japan to be used as slave laborers. But the US is guilty, in some ways, about how to protect uh, the accuracy of truth as well. And I'd like to tell you a story. We had learned that there were 400 POWs and 20 or so unmarked graves in a cemetery in Hawaii. Some graves had as many as 22 remains in them, but the headstone only said unknown in the date. These 400 had all died on a hell ship called Honora Maru. The hell ship, the Honora Maru, was bombed by American bombers. The ship was unmarked. So these men died by friendly fire, by American pilots. So jump ahead to 2018 to where we are making plans to have a memorial service and to have a granite monument installed to honor these men. We get blocked. We want to use the term hell ship in the transcription, but the American Veterans Administration in Hawaii said, oh, no, 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 you can't use that term. You have to use freighters. Well, that's not the accurate term. So after fighting and trips back and forth to Washington, D.C., they finally gave us approval to use the correct term, hell ship. We had to fight for accuracy. My organization would not have placed a monument using the term freighter. It was not correct language and was not right. And I'd like to tell you one last story. This is about the only formal apology by a Japanese company for using POWs as slave laborers during the war. Top leaders from Mitsubishi Materials came to Los Angeles to meet with the POWs and to apologize to them in person. I was there to give remarks and to film it. The apology from the officials of Mitsubishi was heartfelt. And I realized at that point, these Japanese officials who were apologizing were from different generation. None of them were either alive or working at the company during World War II at that time. Here was a generation that understood their responsibility towards history, to acknowledge that it had happened and that it was wrong. It took courage for these gentlemen to travel to the United States and say what they did. It takes courage to look at ourselves and know when to step up and protect history. World War II is becoming a distant memory and our primary sources have mostly disappeared. But the horrible legacy of the war lives on. A divided Korea is one example. But facts are facts and you, the younger generation, must follow the facts wherever they take you by remembering and teaching World War II accurately, you honor those who survived and you honor those who were victims. Again, thank you for hosting this very important conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. And finally, I'd like to welcome Patricia O'Donnell. Um, Patricia O'Donnell is a preservation landscape uh, architect and urban planner uh, who founded Heritage Landscapes in 1987. 
and serves as the president of our World Heritage, a civil society heritage engagement organization. This diverse group of 600 professional commissions has received 99 professional awards for planning and implementation works that foster preservation and enable cultural, economic, environmental, and um, societal sustainability and reinforce rights for heritage uh, places. Ms. O'Donnell thinks globally, aligning works to the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals 2030 Global Agenda and international guidance while acting locally for our shared commonwealth of public landscapes. Heritage projects address the groundswell of contemporary aspirations to care for the earth, value heritage, uplift access, reveal suppressed stories, enhance habitat, and realize greater planetary justice. So I welcome Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure and I thank you for the opportunity to support this program today on international sites of conscience engaging new generations. As our World Heritage Board President, I offer my congratulations on bringing forward this World War II memory event and working to expand the engagement with this important topic, addressing painful heritage. This work places on places of memory uh, holds an important role in our World Heritage 2021 debates as the theme for an entire month of events to explore and share about places of memory. The outcome of that debate includes this ongoing engagement with places of memory and conscience, and today offers another opportunity to share and grow the appreciation for this heritage, as well as deepen its understanding. I note that the International Sites of Conscience 2018 report titled, The Interpretation of Sites of Memory states that sites of conscience and memory are physical places that serve as vessels of intangible heritage linked to that place. These places bring forward the values, memories, and meanings. As a preservation landscape architect and planner, I have had the opportunity to contribute to uplifting places where damaging events ripple down the generations. Through collaboration on a 19th century massacre site, our office and project stakeholders were able to employ design and interpretation as tools to honor the place and foster reconciliation among those most deeply affected. This is important work with a clear purpose of inclusion and equity. The intent is to honor everyone right, everyone's rights and to tell all the stories. This outcome can only be achieved through dialogue, recognition of values, and the uplifting of heritage places toward truth telling and healing. Another goal in focusing on sites of conscience is to recognize and push, push back against injustice and oppression in our world today. OWH recently engaged in a response to the decree to demolish the Beirut silos, a symbol of the damaging explosion that destroyed places and lives in that city in the recent past. The silos of modern heritage hold the memory of that catastrophic event and are critical touchstones for the future. Erasing that heritage is injustice. As a civil society network of people, OWH works to protect heritage through co-learning, advancing the heritage fields and advocacy. We hope you will join us and congratulations and best wishes for a productive exchange today. Thank you. Now, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome um, Jean-Louis Luxen, who is a senior civil 
servant in charge of cultural affairs in his country, Belgium. Um, and he's involved in heritage conservation at the international, has been involved in heritage conservation at the international level since 1990. <coughs> From 1989 to 1993, he was president of the Heritage Committee of the Council of Europe. Um, and from 1993 to 2002, he served as Secretary General of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, involved in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention and in the organization of the NARA Conference in 1994. And in, from 2007 to 2019, he was a member, a cherished member of the Board of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. In 2018, he acted as chair of, um, of the UNESCO Expert Working Group on the Interpretation of Sites of Memory, and he is now a Professor Emeritus at the Catholic University of Louvain. Thank you so much. And back to you. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to those who are watching worldwide. It is an honor to me to have been invited to introduce the debates of such an important seminar on sensitive issues. Thank you to the organizers, the Seoul National University and the International Coalition of Science of Conscience. Even if I refer to my experience as an e-commerce officer for a long time and on the board of the coalition, please note that I do not represent these organizations today, and then rather speak on my, represent my personal views. Just to stick to my allocated time, I have written notes. <laughs> I intend to develop five points, proposing a general framework for our debates. First, the importance of the issue in connection with the current debates at UNESCO, the writing of history, the designation of a memorial site, the presentation and interpretation, and then some reflection about best practice. Those who have experienced violence of an armed conflict are deeply affected. The physical and mental suffering, the suffering of combatants and civilians alike, can last for decades. Moreover, the suffering can also be transmitted through the family and the social environment. Sometimes it becomes an essential element of a group's identity. This is also the case for descendants of communities that have experienced military occupation, domination, apartheid, or forced labor. The transmission of the history of these periods of wounds and humiliations can be supported by memorials to the victims, but also by demands for truth and reparation. The heirs of the victims can then oppose the descendants of the perpetrators when the latter refuse to recognize the facts and to be a responsibility for the violation. Therefore, there is a real need for a process of justice and healing establishing the facts and promoting dialogue in order to reach appeasement and hopefully reconciliation. For such a process, we have reference to a remarkable example, like the Commission for Truth and Reconciliation set up by Nelson Mandela at the end of apartheid. We also have the lessons of strong gesture, like the French president and the German chancellor holding hands at the war cemetery of the First World War in Verdun. Or the Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees at the Ghetto Memorial in Warsaw. And there is also the example of reparations to the victims of the Japanese-American imprisonment camps during World War II. The, there is an important distinction no, sorry. There is an important debate going on at UNESCO at the present time on the issue of the difficult issues dealing with sites of memory 
inscribe of the world at least or dominate the inscription. Within the framework of the World Heritage Convention, there is a strict selection of sites. Most memorial sites could not meet the requirements of inscription, and several conservation experts just consider that sites of negative and divisive memory do not relate to the purpose and scope of the Convention. This is also my opinion. Presently, there is a moratorium on new inscriptions of sites of memory. The working group on sites of recent conflicts is expected to propose and promote guidelines and standards that could, be, that could become reference for all memorial sites. So we'll have to examine the outcome with much attention. It is important to observe that Although the team is related to recent conflicts, the working group is also addressing different cases related to violation of human rights under slavery, dictatorship, colonialism, and discrimination against indigenous people and cultural minorities. ICOMOS, the advisory body to the World Heritage Committee and ICOM, the International Council on Museums, are also addressing these difficult issues through specialized seminars on the team of contested histories. They highlight the challenges of tackling divisive issues and their role in the cathartic process of memory. There is an important distinction to be made between memorial sites. On the one hand, we have sites of memory as such, when the memorial dimension is clearly dominant, while the physical remains have limited heritage values. There are five such sites, memory, inscribed on the list. Auschwitz, Hiroshima, the island of Gore in Senegal, Valongo Wharf in Brazil, two sites connected to the slave trade, and Robin Island, the place of uh, imprisonment of Mandela. The inscription of such sites is thus very exceptional and has always been problematic. On the other hand, we have herit many heritage sites where the memorial dimension is accompanying main significant heritage values. There are many examples of listed properties like Volkring and Iron Works in Germany, the Meiji industrial sites, the cities of Salvador de Bahia or Cartagena de Indias related to the transatlantic slave trade, or Jeddah and the stone town of Zanzibar in relation with East African slave trade. In Zanzibar, the local authorities took the initiative to build a memorial. I personally believe that opening the door to numerous sites of memory of the first category would just jeopardize the whole World Heritage listing. Currently are in preparation dossier for the war cemeteries of the for, for World War I, World War landing beaches of Normandy, landing beaches of Gallipoli in Turkey, ESMA, the Superior School of Military in Argentina, a place uh, where they are victims of dictatorship, the genocide sites of Rwanda, they speak about Stalingrad, and they have several sites related to slavery. I personally believe that priority should rather be given to the second category. Indeed, we observe that difficulties are frequent in these sites, where the somber historical aspects are sometimes not even mentioned in the nomination, or where international recommendations are not taken into account. First main question, who has to write history? 
the first answer coming to mind is that it should be historians according to the methodology of the scientific community. However, we observe that the historians have different analysis and can be under ideological influence. Unfortunately, the state actors or nationalist groups sometimes also promote an aggressive presentation of the past. There is always also the risk that history could be manipulated or rewritten. And we also observe that in many cases, the process is driven by governments or by agency with a political agenda. This is the usual, the usual procedure within an intergovernmental framework like UNESCO. We observe that the World Heritage Committee regularly, for political reasons, overrules the recommendation of its advisory bodies, ICOMOS and IUCN. The politicization of the commission, of the committee, endangers its credibility. The committee is not in capacity to enforce its own request to mention human rights abuse on listed properties. Therefore, it is important to refer to independent academic critical analysis and expert professional reports. It is very important also that the voices of the victims and the su survivors must be permanently included in the process. And this gives a crucial role, besides state actors, to civil society and NGOs similar to Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International. On this question, we can refer to the analysis and the guidelines of the 2013 special report of the Human Rights Council to the UN General Assembly on the writing of history. The second question, how to nominate, how to designate a memorial site? We must bear in mind that the formal designation of a memorial site brings an official approval of the facts and of the narrative as they are presented, with the risk of recognition of a biased presentation, allowing exclusion of alternative narratives, or instrumentalization by interest group with divisive agenda. There are two particular concerns. First, the official recognition of a memorial site needs special care in order to avoid deepening divides and in order to rather bring appeasement. Second, the recognition must always but also avoid interrupting the process of dialogue and reconciliation, a process that can be slow and painful. In order to avoid a biased designation, it is essential to ensure inclusive and effective participation of all potentially stakeholders in the process of preparation of a nomination, their agreement on its plural significance, and their involvement in the ensuing steps. The stakeholders include, namely, other concerned states, local communities where the site is located, local governments, right holders, as well as marginalized group. As we have seen, there are often difficulties in the recognition of the adjacent memorial aspects of a heritage site and additional difficulties in enforcing the request of mention of human rights abuse. Third main question, how to present and interpret a memorial site? Given the potential dissonant views and narratives, the interpretation must be multidimensional and presents the full significance of the site and its full history. 
sides where representation is still contested or favor one narrative over others lead to exclusion and foster divisiveness. Two important points. The facts have to be analyzed in their historical context to avoid what is called presentism, not taking into account the social environment at the time of the events. The second, the interpretation must cover the site historical past and its present day meanings. According to the methodology developed by sites of conscience, the inter interpretation should take into consideration issues of current concerns in relation to the experience of the site. The stakeholders who have an interest in the site, especially victims and marginalized groups, should be engaged in its presentation and interpretation, including of its evolution over time. Indeed, this evolution can bring risk of distortion of the narrative with some form of revisionism. There is also a need to check whether the particular requirements at the time of the official recognition of a site are being effectively observed. On these points, we also have international guidelines like the 2008 ICOMOS Charter on Presentation and Interpretation of Heritage Sites and the 2014 Special Report of the Human Rights Council to the UN General Assembly on memorialization. The management of a memorial site must cover an education and information program with inclusion of the multiple narratives based on historical research and comparative analysis using documentary and archival sources, testimonies, and material evidence. The program is to be particularly made accessible to the youth. We have the positive example of Cambodia, the author piece about the mass murder of the Khmer regime. The case of District 6 in Cape Town in the memory of displacement of the non-white people of a district of the city. And the Monte Soli that will be presented later today. The organizers of the seminar have had the excellent idea to actively involve a younger generation in our reflections and debates. The development of new technologies of information and communication offers a range of techniques and tools that can be used to support educational programs, even at a distance, and take into account the voices of marginalized groups. However, there is an important danger not mentioned on the slide. We must be aware that the same communication technologies and in particular, the so-called me social media can develop disinformation campaigns spreading forms of revisionism. The work of contemporary artists can be powerful e evoking events of the past and establishing a link between past and present feelings. Various, my last point, various appropriate methodologies are, ex are experienced worldwide that can be source of inspiration. As a matter of fact, there is a general consensus on the appropriate process of designation and interpretation of memorial site. However, there is a problem in their implementation. There are often difficulties or resistance from the public authorities and the public opinion of the country where the site is located. There are also difficulties in effective implementation of international recommendations and requirements. And over time, we observe that the history of the site can be rewritten, opening possibility of revisionism. We have two examples in Hammersberg mines in Germany, where forced labor during World War II is documented. The case will be presented later. We can highlight the cooperation between Ellis Island, Antwerp, and Genoa on the issue of migration 
in the past and in present time, and also the tracing memorial on the memory of the Holocaust, three sides of conscience. We should keep in mind that besides the World Heritage Convention, numerous programs, intergovernmental or not, offer the opportunity to take part in an international or regional cooperation, memory of the world, cultural roots, the regional program like the European Heritage Label or the Central Asian Sub-Regional Network on Intangible Heritage. These programs seem often more appropriate to deal with sites of memory. My last point refers to the international coalition as a non-governmental organization that has con developed the concept of sites of conscience, which offers very rich potential. Later today, we will see that its methodology can be applied in a wide range of memorial sites through community dialogue, inclusive of marginalized groups, through promotion of truth telling and connection between analysis of the past and present current issues. We have the good examples of the Museum of Free Derry in Northern Ireland, of the Bangladesh Liberation War Museum, or Villa Grimaldi in memory of the victims of dictatorship in Chile. An extraordinary experience takes place in Memoria para la Concordia in Guatemala, where a community dialogue is established between the descendants of the victims and the descendants of the perpetrators. The coalition, as an independent network, offers a credible alternative, proposing specialized program to the stakeholders, state actors, and non-state actors that sincerely wish to reach an inclusive interpretation, countering revisionism in a common commitment to justice and peace. The point is not to officially designate a site, but rather to engage a permanent process in quest of truth and justice. Thank you for your attention. Right, thank you so much, Jean-Louis. Um, now we are going to take a short break. Um, we are, we had originally scheduled to start our session one at 10.25. We're running a little behind schedule, so we'll start it at 10.30. Um, there is coffee and uh, tea in the back. Um, and we will begin our next session at, at 10.30. Thank you so much.
I'm Ji Hyun Kim from Gongguk University, and this is my great honor and pleasure to moderate session one. Uh, we have just very, uh, heard very inspiring speech by Professor Zhang Lui Luxen. Thank you very much. He covered a very gist of the today's seminar. Um, he emphasized the necessity of dialogue among different stakeholders, including academia, NGOs, survivors, of course. And also, he uh, emphasized the importance of educational program delivering multiple narratives, in particular for the news. So with these, these ideas in mind, let me start the session one, where we can listen to experts' value of ideas on World War II heritage and relevant issues on the current interpretation with a focus on cases on heritage side and the importance of sharing full inclusive histories for future generations. To begin with, let me invite uh, Professor Zhou from Seoul National University to deliver a short overarching uh, presentation on the topic of session one. Um, on the contemporary threats of historical revisionism and the roles of living interpretation at heritage side in confronting revisionism. Professor Zhou, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No slide for me? No? Okay. Then, okay, it's my honor to deliver an introductory remark for session one. Considering we have three or four fascinating presentations, I'll try to shorten my introduction. So let me share my experience with Buenbald Memorial Complex. I visited this memorial complex in summer 2016. First of all, I was overwhelmed by the diversity among inmates. The camp opened in July 1937. The first inmates were German political prisoners who objected the Nazi regime. Later, the camp had several different categories of inmates conscientious objectors, Jews, gypsies, POWs, resistance fighters, foreign leaders under Nazi occupation, and forced laborers. After this camp was liberated, this camp was transformed into Soviet intelligence agency's internment camp. According to official documents, more than 28,000 were imprisoned, and more than 7,000 lost their lives in Soviet the imprisonment camp. Okay, good. Second, I was impressed by the way how this camp was remembered. When the government of Germany made this camp a memorial in 1958, this complex was framed as a beacon of socialist resistance. The statue in front of the memorial tower portrays inmates as resistance fighters. You can see uh, inmates hold flag and several inmates have rifles. This statue is somewhat consistent with the experience in this camp. There were two resistance groups within the camp, and it's hard to believe, but, but this camp was liberated by one of the two resistance groups. So some leaders of this resistance group became the founding fathers of Socialist Unity Party of East Germany, which was the ruling party in East Germany up to 1989. The government of East Germany emphasized resistance aspect of this camp when it set up a memorial complex. So this is a source of the legitimacy for the ruling East, uh, East German party. After the end of Cold War and German unification, this camp set up several monuments to remember 
the victims by the Soviet intelligence agency. A building to remember this, uh, a building to remember the victims. Uh, uh, remember, I mean, sorry, a building to remember this uh, complex as a Soviet intelligence agency's number two special camp was constructed in 1997. And steel bars, which represent the victims of Soviet intelligence agency, were installed. After 2000. A series of new memory stones and installations were set up to remember various groups of victims within this memorial complex. There was an installation. There, uh, there is an installation to remember Jewish uh, forced laborers in quarrying activity. Uh, there is a memory stone for conscientious objectors. There is a memory stone of Allied POWs, and so on. The Buen Belt Memorial Complex shows the interpretation of historic site evolves. It is living rather than fixed. It reflects social changes internally and uh, externally. This memorial complex reminds me of each cast famous definition of history. History is a continuous process of interaction between historian and his facts an unending dialogue between the present and past. So let me clarify my position toward revisionism. Well, frankly speaking, I like revisionism. When you have new fact, new archives, new sets of belief system to challenge conventional understanding of an historical event, it is a starting point to revise the history as long as new facts and new, uh, new archives are genuine and important enough to challenge conventional understanding, revisionism leads to better understanding and help us get closer to reality of a historical event. Meanwhile, when it brings forced archives, incorrect fact with ill intention, your move to revise history mislead people. The distance between reality and understanding widens. Let me share two observation points related with current threat of historical revisionism. So one is related with knowledge entertainment. In these days, personal broadcasting is affordable, and there are people who want to hear what they want. This new development leads to boom of knowledge entertainment by personal broadcasting. I see some risk there. The virtue of objectivity, replica replicability, and neutrality give way to popularity in knowledge entertainment business. So the other is a set of denial and negations. Under the pretext of revis revisionism, negation, what denial often intentionally raised. Based on vested interest rather than fact, there have been challenges against conventional rhythms. As knowledge is more easily transferred by video media uh, rather than typeface media, the risk of negation and denial increase in these days. How we handle these two threats? So frankly speaking, I have vague answers. So rather than, I mean, rather than <clears throat> elaborating my vague answers and sharing my own uh, sophisticated ideas, I would like to pass the ball to presenters today. I'm ready to listen to their presentations. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zhou. Uh, I think you have cast several key questions to us, which can be connected with many speakers, of, uh, many speakers' presentation today, really, including one of the major questions on how we can deal with different memories from the same event. I also do share your concern about the some knowledge entertainers uh, appearing in new media platforms as one of the major contemporary uh, threats. 
Uh, from now on, um, let me invite experts from different countries who will share very interesting cases with their ideas on the World War II heritage and the current day historical revisionism. Um, and uh, first of all, let me invite Mr. Zehat Lent, uh, Managing Director and founding, uh, Foundation Director, Lammesbeck World Heritage Site, Kosla, as a historian, exhibition organizer, and uh, sociologist. He will share the presentation on the interpretation of foreign citizen mobilization at German industrial heritage of world, her world heritage. Uh, Mr. Lynch, floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Nice to meet you all here, and it's a great honor for me to be here. So thank you very much for your polite invitation. As you see, I have divided my speech into different chapters, so it might be much easier for you to follow me by looking on the headlines of each PowerPoint slide. I will talk to you about the interpretation of foreign citizen mobilization and German industrial heritage of World War II concerning the World Heritage Mine sites of Rommelsberg in Goslar. So I'll talk about a practice example. The history of the Federal Republic of Germany was up until the early 1970s characterized by a controversy concerning the responsibility of the citizens for the genocide and the Second World War during the NS period. Mostly we find a perspective of ignoring. In this context, the speech by former federal president Richard von Weizsäcker on the 40th anniversary of, at the end of the war in May 1985 respected a notable turning point in the reception of history by society. Weizsäcker does not only apostrophe this date for the Germans for the first time as a day of liberation, but also calls for a sincere willingness to learn from one's own history and for an active memoration of the suffering of those who were abducted and uprooted through forced labor. Among other things, in consequence, an Remembrance Foundation was established in Germany which made compensation payments for the surviving foreigns, foreign and forced laborers of the Nazi area. Retrospective. The German Reich in the period from 1933 to 1945 was characterized by a fundamental storage of raw materials. The national socialist regime did not seek to counteract this by expanding supranational trade relations but by pursuing a nationalist policy of self-sufficiency. During the Second World War, this situation was accompanied by a general labor shortage. Also a short look at the prehistory. In the Harz Mountains, a low mountain range in the center of Germany, there are archeological finds that indicate intensive mining and smelting of ores dating back to the Bronze Age. From the 10th century Anna Domini, the systematic extraction of resources for the production of zinc, copper, and lead began at the Rammelsberg mine, which ensured great economic prosperity in the region up until the early 20th century. But the Rammelsberg mines got into economic difficulties since 1930, which was due to the global economic crisis on the one hand, and the fall in raw material prices on the other hand, as resources were now increasingly traded on the world market. The situation got so critical for the Rammelsberg mine that it was decided to close it in June, June 1932. Meanwhile, the influence of the NSDAP in the individual states of Germany had grown to such an extent 
that the preservation of metal ore mining was made as a state purpose. And extensive state econo economic aid prevented the Rammelsberg from being shut down. When Hitler seized power in spring of 1933, state economic promotion for an unprofitable mining operation soon gave way to the plan to build a processing plant and sink radiocation smelter, a realization which should make it possible to cover the need for zinc and lead entirely from German ores. The so-called Rammelsberg project realized the demolition of large historical parts of the plan, plant and the complete rebuilding of a mining logistic and processing technology, which should serve, I quote, which should serve to secure the German raw material industry and as part of a four years plan of the year 1936, was to 100% involved in the so-called raw material battle. This was intended to make the economy self-sufficient and the Wehrmacht, so the military, capable of war. Beyond the economic and political implications of the war, it should be noted that the entire facility did not generate any profits until the end of war, but had to be continuously financially supported by the state. As more and more miners and smelters were drafted into military service during the course of Second World War, the nationalists in the National Socialist regime rounded up people from all over Europe and used them as forced laborers under inhumane condition. From December 1943, the so-called Winterthur Barracks Camp, you see it, it's near the Rummelsberg mine. Winterthur means Winter Valley, was a very cold place with less sunlight. The Winterthur Barracks Camp was set up next to the Rummelsberg mine, site below the so-called Herzberger Pond Dam, to accommodate forcibly recruited Ukrainians. In the camp, which was temporarily fenced in, each forced labor had two square meters of space and shared a toilet and a washing area with 120 people in each barrack. At peak times, 330 forced laborers made up almost 40% of the total workforce. They were vulnerable to humiliation, starvation, and disease. The treatment of the forced laborers as so-called subhumans was reflected not only in their sometimes catastrophic food, food supply, but also, for example, in the refusal of heating material in winter of 1943, on the basis that, I quote, the sleeping quarters of the workers from the East should not be heated as long as German soldiers in the East suffered from cold. It is also noteworthy that in June 1944, the camp internal security guards were especially ordered, I quote, to shoot with the intention of hitting. All this happened right in front of the eyes of the Goslar public, who used the Herzberg Pond only 200 meters away from the camp as a swimming and leisure area throughout the entire period. World Heritage Mines of Rammelsberg. With the designation as a World Heritage Site in 1992, the Rammelsberg Mine and the old town of Goslar were elevated to the common cultural heritage of mankind as an, I quote, outstanding example of human creative genius in the fields of mining technique, techniques and industrial water management. As a legacy of humanity and an authentic place of cultural creativity, responsible people of the Rammelsberg Museum began to reflect and analyze their own history, especially that of the national socialist era. In the year 1999 to 2002, numerous surviving Ukrainian forced laborers were interviewed in their hometowns in the Ukraine as part of a research project using the method of oral history. The conversations provided frightening statements about the living conditions and the partially hostile, 
but also hidden solidarity behavior of the German population. They became part of the museum's educational work at the Rammelsberg World Heritage Site and were reflected in a scientific publication in the year 2003 with the title, We Were Almost Children, the Eastern Workers from Rammelsberg. Because of the World Exhibition in Hanover in the year 2000, a new permanent exhibition was designed for the World Cultural Heritage Site the more than 1,000 years of histories were processed in several chapters. One of these chapters depicts the history of the NS time and that of the forced laborers working at the Rammelsberg. This means it was decided to accept and present the topic of abduction and mistreatment of people as an integral part of the history of one's own institution. However, the decision was made not to present the exhibition at the original location of the Winterthur Cap, but more in a rather abstract museum-like presentation. At the moment, the city of Goslar this year is currently celebrating its 1,100 anniversary. In this context, discussions were held on and introduced by us in society and schools how to deal with its own history and to make it visible. After intensive conversations, the municipality will set up information boards on the history of the NS period and how to deal with foreign and forced labors at about six places in the city in the second half of this year. Now, main project, it's the archaeological and historical research project, Spaces of Oppression. For the Rammelsberg World Heritage Site, after interviews with contemporary witnesses had been carried out and permanent exhibition areas had been developed, the question arose of gaining new knowledge as part of a re-evaluation of sources in connection with the archaeological investigation of the authentic site. With the aim of counteracting social ignorance or lack of belief, a project founded by the Friedrich Springer Foundation started in October 2021 in cooperation of historians and archaeologists to excavate the structural remains of the Winterthur camp and to find and record possible everyday objects of the former residents. First of all, a geophysical, geophysical prospection without making any ground movements was carried out in order to define appropriate excavation sections. To give a tip of orientation on the right side of the big picture, you see the so-called Herzberger Pond. There. After a subsequent surface cleaning since March of this year, 9th and 11th graders of Comprehensive School of Goslar Oka have started to make excavation cuts at the original site of Winterthur Camp under professional guidance. They do it to salvage objects, clean them, and archive them. And they do it with great care and high commitment. Several remarkable artifacts were found during the first excavation cuts, which however probably partly date from the post-war period because of their proximate proximity to the surface. This form of concrete history teaching will be carried out with the students in two-week cycle and will be intensively supervised by our museum education staff and scientifically supported by the University of Hanover. This project period is from October 2021 to October 2023. In August of this year, an international volunteer project called Spaces of Oppression, Making Lost Traces Visible, will start at the Rammelsberg World Heritage Site. The project brings together young people from all over Europe and in cooperation with the International Youth Community Services pursues the goal of experiences, the history of past generation 
at the, at the original location, reflecting on it was in the framework of supervised group and transferring it to one's own history. We are very happy that this project can happen and are looking forward to the results of a project that is also for us an experimental character. Conclusion. Since the development of the Rammelsberg World Heritage Site, Visitors Mine and Museum, the institution has been intensively dedicated to the history of national socialism in the context of exhibition, museum education, science and workshops, with activities not only focusing on keeping memories alive, but also on a critically reflecting on one's own dealing with history. So, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. It was a very impressive presentation in that the site has continuously uh, reflected new historical findings uh, from researches and dialogues, uh, and the did make actual changes in their exhibitions. Uh, those projects for young students are really inspiring, and in particular, the you know Peel Peel uh, project, student joining the excavation. Yeah, I want to join as well. It seems very interesting. Uh, as one of the core objectives of today's seminar is sharing the good practices. And uh, I think your contribution was very meaningful and valuable in that sense. Thank you again. Now, let me invite the second speaker, Professor David Palmer from University of Melbourne. Professor Palmer has conducted researches on international labor history with recent focus on Japan's wartime labor system and forced labor of prisoners of war and Koreans, as well as the history of Nagasaki. Today, he will share several key findings from recent researches. Professor Palmer, the yeah, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, Professor Joe of uh, Seoul National University and also to the sponsors. Uh, and I greatly appreciate what's been put into being able to allow me to come all the way from Australia. It's a long trip, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. Our international seminar today focuses on the inclusion of underrepresented voices and experiences related to the war. If we consider Japan's sites of the Meiji Industrial Revolution inscribed as World Heritage in 2015, however, there are thousands of voices that have no representation at these sites. Or they are represented, or they are represented, uh, their history is distorted. I will make the case that core sites in this World Heritage Array are in fact scenes of past war crimes, though they are not currently identified in that way. My example will be the treatment of allied prisoners of war with a focus on Australian POWs who were at Mitsui's Mike coal mine in Omuta Kyushu. I will offer alternatives to the way the Japanese government currently presents the history of this former coal mine. We can begin by acknowledging the stories of the Australians themselves. One individual, Private Dave, David Runge, will be our key witness. He was a driver in the 8th Australian Division, Australian Army Service Corps, and was a prisoner of the Japanese from 1940 to 1945. His story reveals the full barbarity of Imperial Japan's entire forced labor system throughout the empire a system that can best be described as a form of slavery. Let us first establish the legal basis for this claim, citing the precedent of international law. Prisoners of war during World War II had rights and responsibilities defined under international law by the 1929 Geneva Convention which was based on the earlier precedent of the Fourth Hague Convention of 1907. The Geneva Convention is the foundation for prosecution of war crimes and is as relevant today as it was in the last century. 
Japan argued that it had signed the Geneva Convention but not ratified it. But as historian Yuma Totani has noted, the prosecution at the Tokyo War Crimes Trial stated that Japan had ratified the 1907 Convention, which, quote, required Japan's adherence, not only to codified rules, but also to the general principle that prisoners of war should be treated humanely. Was Mitsui's Mike coal mine now World Heritage inscribed, a place where war crimes were committed in World War II? The Tokyo trial ruled that war crimes were committed there, but one would never know this if visiting that World Heritage site today. I do consider the Mitsui Mike coal mine deserves to be inscribed as a World Heritage site, even though its industrial and technological history as presented by the Japanese government and Meiji Industrial Revolution sites, director Kato Koko is distorted and not entirely accurate. In this brief presentation, however, I will focus on how the wartime history of Mitsui Mike coal mines, use of forced labor, and in particular prisoners of war, was a part of a broader war-focused economic system under Imperial Japan, and why it is crucial that this and other sites represent the full history accurately. Japan justified its 2015 nomination for the Meiji industrial sites using these criteria for the UNESCO operational guidelines for the implementation of the World Heritage uh, Convention. Sites must first, and these are quotes, exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within a cultural area of the world on developments in architecture and technology. Two, bear in a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living or which has disappeared. Three, be an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural, or technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates a significant stage in human history. I just want to emphasize again, this were the, these were the criteria that Japan cited in its nomination. Now let us return to Dave Runge's story at the Mike coal mine as a prisoner of war and test these values as claimed by the Japanese government for that site. Dave was born in 1922 in Murwalumba, New South Wales, a country town in rural Australia. His father came from Denmark. His mother was born in Queensland while her father had migrated from Ceylon before the white Australia policy excluded Asian migrants from the country. Dave Runge grew up in the multicultural neighborhood known as Solomon's Row, a community with a mix of South Sea Islander, Aboriginal, and South Asian residents of color. When he was eight, his mother died, and his father left the family, leaving his oldest sister to raise him. Dave finished primary school and then got a job as a driver at a local banana plantation. He entered the Australian Army at age 17. The Army for Dave was a community and in a way it was a family he never had. This was very much in the tradition of what we call Australian mateship. His cultural background helped him survive the hard years as a prisoner of the Japanese later. Dave also had to adjust to the strange world of Japan's imperial empire and war and the reality of Japanese racism toward other Asians. Decades later, he reflected on this when he was interviewed by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and these are his words. I always thought Japanese were like us. We fought them like their attitude, Japanese soldiers and us. But I seen enough in Singapore when they cut off people's heads, and I seen a bunch of five or six Chinese women with lips sewed up and dragged along the street by string and these sorts of torches. Well. You get a different attitude toward the Japanese then, don't you? The Asians thought that 
when the Japanese came down, the Japanese were Asia for Asians, but it was Japanese for Japanese, end of quote. Dave and his platoon were captured by the Japanese in Timor and taken to Singapore as prisoners. From there, they were sent to work on the Thai Burma Railway, where an estimated 15,000 Australian POWs endured what can only be called slave labor. All allied POWs working on the line, as the railway came to be called, totaled 61,700 along with some 250,000 Asians of many nationalities. Some 2,800 Australian POWs died from this ordeal, while total allied POW deaths were over 12,600. He survived and was transferred from the camps back to a POW hospital in Kanchanaburi, After recovering from severe malnutrition and malaria, he and others were taken on a ship crammed with men below deck to Moji Port uh, in Japan, and that was described earlier as what, they, what, 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 were, what are known as the hell ships. Then they were transferred to Omuta, site of Fukuoka, Camp 17, the largest POW camp inside Japan, next to Mitsui Mike coal mine, the largest coal mine in Japan. We're missing a slide here, but anyway, we'll, we'll not worry about it. By 1945, there were over 15,000 workers at the Mike Mine Complex that included ad, the adjacent smelter. Of these, approximately 13,400 were Japanese, while the remainder were all forced laborers. Allied POWs numbered 1,910, 829 Americans, 440 Australians, 268 British, 355 Dutch and 18 other nationalities. I'll just add here because we're missing the, the, the full uh, statistics in the slides. There were uh, uh, hundreds of Koreans, hundreds of Chinese forced laborers, and um, roughly about 13,000 or so Japanese. Okay. 138 POWs died in captivity, most from diseases contracted through malnutrition and from accidents, while only a few were executed by guards, but daily beatings uh, of most prisoners was routine, and Dave and his mates expected this regularly. In response, he secretly organized slowdowns in the, in the mine tunnels, but two new prisoners informed on him. As punishment, guards put him on a concrete slab in a hut in the dead cold of winter, forcing him to sit on his knees while they put weights on uh, his upper legs to increase the weight. What you see here is the original torture that was done in, under Meiji to convicts, and then on, on the right is a similar torture used in Southeast Asia against local people. After a number of days of this treatment, he lost feeling in his legs and gangrene set in. This required amputation of his legs at the knee. This type of torture actually was part of J Japanese management's mining tradition going back to the 19th century when this method was used on Japanese convict miners who had tried to escape. This torture happened during Meiji in the 1880s and 1890s when Mike Mine supposedly represented, quote, an important interchange of human values, unquote. It certainly represents, quote, an exceptional testimony of a cultural tradition, unquote. One that extended from Meiji with Japanese prisoners who were miners to Australian prisoners who also were miners, half a century apart, but a continuous cultural tradition, nevertheless. There's the stats you can see. This will just give you an idea of, this, of the spread and also the importance of the connection between the, uh, the allied POWs and the experience of the Koreans and, and, and Chinese forced laborers. We cannot separate those two. You have to think of them as a, as a, as a common experience. 
The stories of these miners, whether World War II, prisoners of war, Japanese convicts in the late 19th century, are part of the Mitsui Mike coal mine history. To ignore this history of the people who dug the coal and made the Japanese empire possible is a travesty. But the extent of Mitsui's broader connection to empire is also a key part of this story. The Thai Burma Railway used labor that was transferred from Southeast Asia to Japan, prison labor that violated international law. Dave Runge's torture clearly was a war crime, and a few of the guards involved in torture and executions at Mekay Mine were tried after the war and executed, but you will not find any of this history when at the Mekay Mine, or at the Takashima and Hashima Gunkanjima coal mines, or at the Nagasaki shipyard, or at the Iwata Steelworks. The sites at the shipyard in Iwata are not even open to the general public, and yet they are World Heritage listed. You will find this history at Nagasaki, at the independent Oka Masaharu Peace Memorial Museum. This museum represents neither si either another side of Japan, the Japanese people who have criticized the way in which the Meiji Industrial Revolution sites have been presented to the public, these Japanese include peace activists, retired teachers, independent researchers, and others who have worked to bring recognition of Japan's wartime history and abuses of foreign forced laborers. The Nagasaki activists have regularly hosted former allied POWs who visit the city. They have assisted in having memorials to the POW camps erected, and in my own case, assisted me in getting the Japanese government to grant Hibakusha status and benefits for Alan Chick, the last living Australian POW who survived the Nagasaki bomb while working for Mitsubishi. And this is me and Alan, as you can tell. Um, the problem of failing to tell the history of prisoners of war at Mike coal mine or forced labor of Koreans and, Jap and Chinese at this and other sites is not the fault of the Japanese people, but of the Japanese national government. I believe that an independent historical exhibition of the Australian POW experience at Mike coal mine can break through this resistance by the company and the Japanese government. It is in the interest to tell the full story, to let the unheard voices of these POWs be heard today. My proposal to help organize this historical exhibition, focused on the Australian POWs, but inclusive of other nationalities and groups, particularly Koreans and Chinese, subjected to forced labor at the Mekay Mine. It can draw on the practice and experience of the Verstopena Museum of Contemporary History, Linz, Austria, that focuses on Third Reich foreign forced labor used at the site of the former Zwerkswerke Hermann Goering, now Verstopena Stahlwelt GmbH, a major steel products fabrication plant still operating. The museum is open to the public on company property and has the full support of the company. In Nagasaki, there is an outdoor museum at the tunnel openings of Mitsubishi's former Sumiyoshi underground torpedo factory. The historical signage outside the lighted tunnel display that includes a torpedo is comprehensive and mentions forced mobilization of Koreans who dug out rocks blasted from the tunnels. What happened after the atomic bombing also is explained in detail on the outdoor plaques. The exhibit was supported by the city government at the initiative of the Nagasaki Japanese activists, but its location is at a parking lot usually full of cars and few visitors to Nagasaki know of the site's existence. My proposal for a special exhibition focused on the Australian POWs who were at the Mike coal mine can initially be launched in Australia, and then it can travel to other appropriate countries. The Thai Burma Railway, so that history so it must be included, so that history must be a part of the broader Mike mine 
history. And the reason for that is that uh, the majority of Australian POWs came from that experience at the Tyburma Railway. Ultimately, I would like to see this exhibition shown in Nagasaki, where so much progressive historical investigation has gone on for decades, by Japanese, by the way, and where there is a supportive local community. Nagasaki is only an hour drive from Omuta, where the Mikkei Mine is located. I think if we can have Dave Wrench's voice heard in Kyushu, that many will listen and learn from that experience. His ordeal and how he survived with the help of his mates. I also think that many will welcome this change to how history is presented at the Omuta and Nagasaki sites, and that it can be a necessary recognition of the allied POWs and Korean and Chinese forced laborers under Imperial Japan in World War II. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Palmer. It is very impressive because your extensive, extensive researches and valuable insights uh, contribute to the today's seminar law. Um, it is very interesting to see in particular that um, you mentioned about the involvement of different stakeholders from academia and NGOs who are uh, talking about the uh, ignored, uh, unheard voices about the foreign uh, labors during the World War II. Uh, I also like to support your ideas of exhibition, yeah, which is very interesting, and I hope to see that exhibition can be held in Nagasaki in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think um, I should share a sad news uh, at this point, because uh, uh, due to the unexpected technical issues, our third speaker from Thailand, who was supposed to join online today, could not make it, and um, I'd like to ask for your kind understanding for this issue. So let me invite uh, Professor Nagano Ryoko as our last speaker of the session one. Professor Ryoko is a professor of international relations in the Faculty of Law at Kanazawa University, Japan. And her research interests are UNESCO, cultural diplomacy, and memory conflicts in East Asia in particular. And today's presentation deals with, uh, deals with one of the cases she recently explored in depth. Please welcome Professor Yoko. Floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, um, it's a great pleasure to meet you all, um, even though it's virtual. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizer for inviting me to this important event. So what I would like to talk about today is about um, how national nostalgia plays a role in heritage diplomacy. And I would like to look at the case of Japan's industrial heritage sites. So my talk is linked to the previous speaker's discussion, but I'd like to focus more on the historical revisionism. So let me begin with this remark from UNESCO's website. It's about world heritage. Heritage is our legacy from the past, what we live with today, and what we pass on to future generations. Our cultural and natural heritage are both irreplaceable sources of life and inspiration. I think the idea of world heritage is very important, and uh, it should be cherished. So heritage is not just you know, for one nation. It can be shared by many nations, many people. And if we can have shared heritage of humanity, then we can also think about the future together. We can pass on the legacy from generations to generations. I think the idea is so noble, so important, but unfortunately, some, some world heritage sites become the source of controversy and disputes and conflicts. So Japanese sites of Meiji Industrial Revolution, this also becomes a source of controversy and the dispute is still continuing. These sites, these sites um, 
site of Japan's major industrial revolution is inscribed, was inscribed in World Heritage List in 2015. And if you look at the description, you can see that these sites are this, the symbols of Japanese modernization and industrialization in Bakumatsu and Meiji period. But as you probably already know, um, this, these sites, particularly one site called Gunkanjima or Battleship Island, invited lots of criticism because of the lack of respect for Korean and Chinese memories of forced labor. And despite those criticisms, the Japanese government promoted the site as world heritage. And that caused the escalation of disputes between Japan and South Korea. So my question is, why did the Japanese government advance a campaign for former industrial sites as world heritage, even though there are some alarmed voice, both in and outside Japan? And I also would like to ask, how is it possible to counter such movements? So I would like to introduce some key concepts or you know, some helpful concepts which might help us to think um, about the issues of uh, historical revisionism and also heritage disputes, heritage politics. One of them is heritage diplomacy. I would like to define heritage diplomacy as the state's strategic action to create or promote shared heritage across borders. And by doing so, it would also help to enhance interconnectivity and international cooperation. So your national heritage is not just for your own nation, it can be shared by many other nations. But I think that there are two different directions in heritage diplomacy. The first one is outward looking. So it is to win international support for shared heritage because the focus is on international um, support, uh, to win the international support. You have to be open to consultation with external actors. So sometimes, a historical narrative of you know historical historical narrative of the nation can be changed, reshaped through international dialogues because you want to engage international external actors. But I think there is also an inward-looking direction in heritage diplomacy, and this is to win domestic support rather than international support for national heritage. If you take this direction of inward looking approach, then, well, basically you are committed to a national interpretation of heritage. So the acquisition of external support reinforces the value of national heritage, and that's why you try to acquire external support, you know, international recognition, particularly UNESCO's recognition can work well to make sure that um, national heritage is recognized as great. But if you take that direction, if you focus too much on it, then you are actually reluctant to engage with external actors at the expense of its historical, um, other historical narratives. So um, I would say that um, if you focus too much on this inward looking approach, then you may also lose external support. And unfortunately, that is a case of Japan's industrial heritage. So perhaps many of you know this, but the uh, sites of Japan's major industrial, industrial revolution um, actually includes lots of different properties and sites. So 11 sites within eight areas, mainly located on the Kyushu and Yamaguchi region. And if you look at the descriptions of those sites, you can see the uh, expressions like the first successful transfer of industrialization from the West to a non-Western nation. This rapid industrialization was achieved 
over a short space of just over 50 years between 1850s and 1910. And Japan moved from a clan-based society in the Edo period to a major industrial society with innovative approaches to adapting Western technology in response to local needs. And it profoundly influenced the wider development of East Asia. So this is not just a you know, Japanese achievement. It actually has a big impact on the development of East Asia. And this kind of description, this kind of narrative actually fits in very well uh, with what former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo uh, also described about Meiji Japan. So for him, uh, Meiji Japan symbolizes Japan's people's hardship, skills, and dedication to the state of Japan. And I would call this as national nostalgia. It is a useful nostalgia to mobilize the people to overcome challenges and hardships. And well, when you listen to the speeches by former Prime Minister Abe, you can see that you know, Abe also describes about the uh, challenges in the 21st century. You know, Japan faced many challenges and in order to overcome those challenges, it is necessary to have people's hardships, skills, and dedication to the state of Japan. So you see that um, Meiji nostalgia uh, is used for mobilizing, to mobilize people uh, to work for the prosperity of Japan in future. But by doing so, by emphasizing this point, perhaps the, the government also neglected other historical narratives of Hashima or the battleship island. Now, I tried to create a diagram, diagram to explain um, the situations inside Japan. Well, I mentioned that even within Japan, there were some alarmed voices. You know, there were some concerns about promoting Japan's industrial heritage as world heritage without, you know, looking at the uh, forced labor memories. Particularly, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually expressed their concerns about you know, the promotion of uh, major industrial sites. Well, Ministry of Foreign Affairs was concerned that uh, it might cause uh, further disputes between Japan and South Korea. And then Ministry of Education also was concerned that uh, this is a controversial place. So, you know, without, um, without uh, talking about the negative history, was it really okay to, you know, promote this as world heritage? And in fact, uh, world heritage matters were usually discussed under the Council of Cultural Affairs. And then there were some Japanese expert committee on world heritage. But for the case of industrial heritage, Abe's government created a new expert committee on the industrial heritage because um, some of the assets in the industrial sites are still operating. So they are described as industrial heritage, which include operating assets, so they are not under the jurisdiction of Japan's Act on Protection of Cultural Property. It's not cultural property because it's still operating. And that's why there is a new committee. They established a new committee on the industrial heritage, and then they invited some Japanese industrial heritage experts and also Western industrial heritage experts. And uh, many of them were close to um, Mrs. Kato Koko, Japanese industrial heritage expert, but also closely re related to Abe, uh, former Prime Minister Abe and LDP. So under this um, yeah, situation, basically uh, Japan started promoting the major industrial heritage as world heritage. Now, in 2015, there was a, a World Heritage Committee meeting, and 
well, there was a, a there were Korean and also Japanese delegates, and of course, uh, you know, the major industrial site includes Gunkanjima or Battleship Island, and uh, it became a you know source of controversy. But uh, there was a closed meeting between Japanese and Korean delegates, and eventually, Japan promised. Jap Japan decided to promise to take measures that allow an understanding that there were a number of Koreans and others who were brought against their will and forced to work under harsh conditions in the 1940s. And because of this promise, the Korean government seemingly agreed to accept this as world heritage. But what happened afterwards was completely different from this promise so Kato Koko, newly appointed as a special advisor to the Abe cabinet, collected information and oral testimonies of the Japanese resident nearby. And then they also gave testimonies about the situations in Gunkanjima or Abatoship Island. And basically, those oral testimonies suggested that there were no forced labor. So in 2020, the Industrial Heritage Information Center was established in Tokyo, and that information center only included information that denied forced labor in Hashima. And that's why the dispute is still ongoing. Now, what I, um, what I try to do is to, well, think about, you know, why the Japanese government especially well, Kato Koko, Abe Shinzo, um, those people decided to promote um, the Meiji heritage, a Meiji industrial heritage at the expense of um, other alternative narratives. And I'd like to introduce uh, this sociological concept, ontological insecurity. Uh, it is defined as a loss of consistent self-identity and the source of ontological insecurity uh, is the disruption of the routines or the disruption of one's biographical narrative. I mean, everyone has a certain sense of identity, but when identity is based on a single nationalist, national narrative, then if somebody challenges your national narrative, you feel a sense of insecurity, fear. There is a fear of losing um, one's identity. And for historical revisionists, the defense of a single historical narrative based on national nostalgia is crucial to their ontological security. So the defense of a single historical narrative actually eliminates the potential of creating a new identity by denying different ways of remembering the past. Now, I think that uh, we do not have to stick to one single historical narrative and one single national identity, and many of us actually have multi-layered identities, especially in this globalized era. And by admitting past wrongs and imagining the self, outside a single historical narrative, one can actually internalize a sense of shame and redefine the self in its relationship with others. The basis of identity should be placed not on a single monolithic narrative of the self, but on, a, on the multiple, um, sometimes contradictory self-concepts. And ontological security can be attained by accepting multiple historical narratives. It doesn't have to be just based on one single historical narrative. So I would say that adaptability and openness is a key to um, overcome this historical revisionism, the key to the acceptance of alternative historical narratives. And my final word is that perhaps um, it is important to focus more on heritage education rather than heritage listing, uh, which leads to plural interpretations of heritage. And for this reason, I think that this kind of event is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ryoko. Uh, as many previous speakers said, 
she affirmed the importance of the uh, multiple narratives, and uh, I believe she really shared her academic view towards uh, this issue with a very interesting case, which very much connected to uh, Professor Palmer's presentation as well. Thank you again. Uh, I have a good news. Yeah, I found Thai speaker. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, she finally yeah, managed to uh, join us online. So, let me ask her to say hello to us. Uh, Ms. Hello. Ms. Park Pung? Yeah. Are you there? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Can we connect her via Zoom? Yeah, I think our staff Hello? has authority to share her screen. Hello? Ms. Sermi Pakik Pum, uh, head of Moang Singh Historical Park in contemporary uh, Thailand, we share the diversity of war recalls in history and Thailand's death railway. Um, I think she joined via Zoom. Can we see her? Oh, okay. Finally, I found her. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So I will okay. give you full floor so that you can share your valuable ideas with us. Thank you. Uh, sorry for inconvenience because now in Thailand it's very heavy storm. Then it might be lost in space actually thank you for uh, having me on this talking thank you for the organized the talk i honor to be here or live as a speaker to you today my uh, talk today will focus on the work as the archaeologist to do the project uh, on the survey of the Thai Burmese Railway Project and uh, Fire Art Department as my work is uh, most of the cultural heritage management, uh, heritage sites in Thailand. We concentrate on the manage, management of the site work in Thailand. Then one of the, our project is try to uh, nominate the Thai Burmese railway set to the World Heritage Sites. Then we are concentrate on the, 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 the designated of the site itself, not the, the, the thing behind that one. Then I will into the, the detail of the, the the sites. Yeah. The Second World War railway within Thailand is begun, begin the connected in uh, Nong Pradup st station. Because in Thailand, we already have the system of the railway state, rail, railroad from the north to the to center of Thailand and south to the center of Thailand. Then uh, in the period of uh, after World War I, then people interested in uh, connected in the aspect of economic and thing. Then the government of Thailand start to uh, do the survey of a possibility to build up the connected the east to the west. Then the project is begun, but during the World War II, the Japanese uh, interested in uh, join the track from Malaya, Ma Malaysia, Malayu, uh, via Burma to the, the target is to India. Then from the South Mal Malayu to center of Thailand, we already have the, the track then the project of this railway start at Nong Pradu, Lachaburi. Uh, 
join with the Banpo Station District in Lachapuri Province, travel to Kanchanaburi Province, and terminate at the uh, three station nearby. Through the border of Thailand in Sangkabuli, the railway in Thailand is uh, approximately 303, 304 kilometers in length. Period of the Second World War, the joy of exploration and uh, feasibility study on the potential railway link between Thailand and Burma. Uh, was undertaken by the government of Thailand and Burma. The source of the study indicated that the construction of the railway would require altering the surrounding terrace significant within uh, 300 kilometers of the railway, having to be traveled across the river through dense late reinforcement. It's what concluded that the railway will take at least five years to construct, and the cost associated with the project would be high. Consequently, plan for the potential railway connected Thailand and Burma were defense during World War II. The Japanese government had planned to develop a railway that linked the east to the west, as I told you for purpose of advancing military operation and furthering economic development in Southeast Asia region post-war. Then in 1941, however, Thailand rail network are not extensive spanning just nationwide. The Japanese proposed the construction for a few railway doors, reviving the bridge the British and the Thai government plan to construct the railway link between the Thailand and Burma. A total of uh, 415 kilometer railway, uh, 304 in Thailand and 100 kilometer in Thailand and 111 kilometers in Burma was proposed for the Second World War railway. Construction of the railway con commerce is in both Thailand and Burma. Similarly, it was anticipated to be complete within one year. In Thailand, construction began in Nong Paduk, largely as I told earlier, traveling toward the Kanchanaburi province and a, a bridge was constructed across the in order to allow access to the rest of Kanchanaburi province, advances technology and supply was limit as resource of the war time, and the time frame allowing from the construction of the railway was neat and circumstantial at the time. Through our different evaluation of the East West route from the prehistoric period of that uh, Bangkok period, Kanchanaburi have been playing a continuing role of uh, connected between Thailand and the less of the Southeast Asia region during to not only the strategic location, but also the rich natural result. The surrounding terrace of doors maximize for construction of the railway with utilization of the Cranoy River as the main transport and with the utilization nearby village and forest as source of building material, just as a timber and the off for the railway. For utilization of the last workforce, as a thousand, hundred thousand individuals was among factors that contribute to the completion of the Second World War Railway within a short time frame. 
similar to other factor that leads to the completion of the railway and created of the workforce was a result of circumstances associated with the war. This workforce was utilized and in, in construction for the railway start from October 1942 and uh, finish in December 1943. Increase the prisoner of war uh, uh, from the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Netherlands, and uh, some of them is the United States, and the worker from Thailand, Malaya, Indonesia, Indonesia, India, Burma, China, and even Vietnam. Tropical disease as top, sorry, tropical disaster associated with the living of in the jungle, along with the excessive work, no malnutrition and infrastructural medicine, me, me, medical supply results more than 60,000 deaths along the railway. In uh, Part of the history of the Second World War railway is significant because of its connected to the historical of many countries and uh, many individuals allowed the world. Following the, the end of the Second World War, other country built two war cemetery at Dolak and Chongkai to, to intend to limit remind uh, the ally prisoner of war who died while wearing, uh, building the railway. Don Lak and Chong Kai were maintained by the Commonwealth War Glaive Commissioner and have been corroborated, maintained by the Thai government from since uh, 1954 onward. Commemorative cemetery and hope are held for the prisoner of war and the worker every every year, which people coming from all over the world in order to collectively remember the period in the history is with different culture, also built uh, in a different religion as in Tayanu Son memorial near Liverpool Square Beach in order to commemorate uh, the uh, prisoner of war and the air worker who built along the, who died along the Leo, the railway and uh, no monument no uh, display the message, may peace prevent on earth, which is being translated into six languages uh, Thai, Chinese, Vietnamese, Malay, Japanese, and English as the, the victim of uh, the construction. Uh, after the war, Kajabuli province and the state railway of Thailand uh, corroborate, conserve, conserve the auto authenticity of the origin setting and function of the Second World War railway uh, at uh, Nong Pradok Station, which are both utilized and preserved, present, presented as the present day in Thailand. The origin setting of the River Square Bridge and Tam Kase Bridge have also been retained. Post war conservator work have been done on the railway include the maintenance of the origin slipper, con concrete footing and the bricks still constructed. Uh, some of them be damaged during the, the bridge have been, uh, during the, the attack have been replaced with new material similar to the origin and keep or uh, to the original designs and setting, including the wooden bridge from the Tham uh, Kase Bridge. As the, now so there is really a, like a tourist hotspot. At present only 130 kilometers of the 
304 kilometers clear way and uh, 60 station from 31 station are in use from transport in Gajanaburi province. And uh, the health five paths have been conserved and uh, redeveloped into an interpretation center of the historical. And not only the health five park, but also the historical of the Second World War railway itself. Uh, the Australian government contributed to the construction and maintains for the Hill Pie Pass Memorized Museum with the intention of the place where people could come together and remember of the past in situ. The Second World War Railway include, uh, as I told you, 130 kilometer railway and uh, associated type include the uh, Nong Praduk Station, River Quare Beach, Tam Kasai Bridge, Tayanu Son, and Manish, uh, 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 Memory of uh, Chong Kai and Don Lap War Cemetery and the Hillfire Path. Conservation and management of most of this area, particularly the the railway, the railway and the railroad and the station and the bridge, are the responsibility uh, responsibility to the Liao the state railway station of Thailand, uh, and legal protected for the railway and associated site is uh adequate in place, the state railway uh, and uh, most of the monument will be protected by the monument law of uh, of uh, uh, fire art department. Uh -huh. And um, uh, all of the sus uh, sustainable conservation and area management work on the railway is associated site have been undertaking of the collaboration between Thai government and uh, some of the non-government uh, organization and the international organization. The conservation of the area and the man management will be held as this necessary. And uh, the next one that I would like to talk is about the criteria that we choosing for this uh, uh, World War II Thai Burma railway uh, for the UNESCO, uh, for the UNESCO standard of the, which criteria we are try to present. Uh, the railway, we choosing the, the criteria number four, to be an outstanding example for a type of building, architecture, and technological assembly or the landscape, which illustrates a significant stage in human history, as you know, it a uh, part of the Second World War. That there was outstanding uh, system of the trade instruction, which further or aspect a military railway construction during the war. And it's showcase of engineering technology method and to adapted to the time in which we so lack. The railway, the, the, the railway was also demonstrate of an effort of Akai ambition expectation under challenge associated with a uh, war time include the tight time frame limit of work, limited workforce and resource constant given that the Leo where was uh, construction in the remote and dense uh, rainforest with the humid climate living and working condition were a Polling and result in the death of over 60,000 members of the workforce. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, since we are quite have little oh. time. Oh, sorry. Could you uh, in 30 seconds? I'm very sorry to push you. It's, a, it's all right. I just too nervous. And uh, another criteria is the five criteria is to be outstanding example of the human settlement, land use or sea use with representative of culture of human in, uh, interaction within the environment, especially when it has become vulnerable under the impact of irreversible change. That's all. We 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 choosing the two criteria, and uh, the the criteria number six is along with number five. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prakitipum. Since you, you know, it was really hard for you to join online finally, and I'm very glad that you made it. And uh, you shared very uh, valuable insight about the meaning of your uh, this site, uh, in particular that um, you have the issues in the management, and um, uh, because you know it is very uh, hot spot for tourist tourism, and. Uh, uh, it's really nice to hear that you are you have some explanation on the victims and just you know, try to provide many languages as possible so that you can reach to various audience. Uh, well, although time is very limited, uh, we'd like to have a very short uh, Q&A session and discussion. We already do have one question that uh, received through Zoom. Uh, and also, we have two mics near the stage. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, and then our staff will guide you to uh, take the microphone to share your ideas. And uh, meanwhile, uh, the speakers for session one, could you come to the stage so that you can talk to each other and also talk to audience of today? Thank you. It seems we have uh, several more questions uh, received through Zoom. So oh, for the audience, yeah, of course you can join for the questions as well. Um, the question number one that I received from Zoom is that uh, I'm curious if there are any specific case where we can better understand the outwarding looking direction of the heritage diplomacy, winning international support uh, for shared heritage. I think this question is quite directly related to Professor Yokos. And uh, there is a one question for Mr. Lentz as well. Thank you very much for your presentation. Given the many layers of this site, has there been a study on what particular narrative visitors are most drawn to? So these are two questions that I received for two speakers. And meanwhile, meanwhile of course, you are very free to join the microphone. Well, thank you very much for your question. Yes, in my um, presentation, I talked about outward looking and inward looking directions in heritage diplomacy. And uh, I, I would like to say that I'm not, um, I don't mean to say that there is purely outward looking heritage diplomacy or purely inward looking heritage diplomacy. Um, I think usually um, heritage diplomacy has both directions, both kind of emphasis, but it's a matter of degree. And in the case of Japan, perhaps uh, it's more, uh, it has more emphasis on inward looking attitude, um, it, you know. But uh, yeah, outward looking diplomat heritage diplomacy, um, I, I think, uh, you know, this is a matter of how to create a shared historical narrative. And uh, of course, uh, once, you, you know, you promote your own national heritage as world heritage. You also have to listen to the, um, you know, experts' opinions. And uh, in this sense, uh, probably, you know, talking to Ecomos people already, 
uh, gives an external viewpoint. Um, but I think it's also probably interesting to look at joint nomination, you know, nomination by two or more states. Um, in, in that case, of course, you have to talk to, you know, other uh, people in other countries. And what I can think of uh, is, well, for example, the Silk Road. Um, I think um, China, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, Kazakhstan uh, promoted their heritage as uh, you know, part of Silk Road heritage, and it was successfully inscribed in the World Heritage List. Um, but in order to get to this point, actually, they had lots of meetings, sub-regional meetings, uh, between, well, first, first among the Central Asian uh, countries and China. And of course, there is always a kind of power relations behind the discussion, but still you have to negotiate with, uh, you know, with other experts. And uh, then um, I think uh, Ecomos expert also gave some suggestions. So um, there is a kind of common understanding now that it's not just one route for Silk Road. There are multiple routes, multiple, multiple corridors. So there is a space for other countries to promote you know, their heritage as part of Silk Road's heritage. And so even though, of course, uh, you know, how increased it can be or, you know, um, yeah, I, I think there are lots of problems, but even so, a joint nomination process actually helps states to become more outward looking. So um, I'd like to suggest that um, if you are interested in outward looking diploma heritage diplomacy, perhaps you can have a look at the Silk Road. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ryoko. Actually, I read her a wonderful paper on that sacred case, and I do believe that that kind of joint nomination is a very good way to sort out these difficult you know, issues uh, with the dissonant memories on this you know, same event. And uh, with that kind of you know, like, um, legal process or also some policy process, we can stimulate the uh, discussion with all different stakeholders. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, since we have second question to Mr. Lentz, uh, would you like to answer? Uh, I can remind you that uh, if um, the question was given the many layers of the site, has there been a study on what particular narrative visitors are most drawn to? That is the question for you. Yeah, thank you for your, well, you can, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, on the World Heritage side of Rammelsberg, we have about 120,000 guests every year and paying guests, for, for example, because we, we need a little bit of money. We are not uh, so much supported by the national government. And uh, about 20% of them come from other European countries, not from Germany. And about uh, 10,000 of them are youngsters who are working with us in different workshops. So they have the chance um, to make their own experience concerning, concerning uh, the life of, what's this? <laughs> some, some alarming concern. <laughs> concerning uh, the life of the foreign workers and also uh, this year we have special so-called summer school and in summer school uh, young students between the age of 10 and 15 can take part in a workshop for three hours or for three days to learn about the living conditions of the foreign workers of that time. And so it's uh, for us a normal um, concept of education to bring into contact our young visitors with the story and the history of uh, the men and women who are working there in generally, and especially uh, with the history of the forced, work forced workers. Thank you very much, Mr. Lenz. Yeah, I think you know that kind of involvement with, and the discussion with the young people, uh, with with, uh, yeah, I think it's sorted out. <laughs> yeah, 
uh, that is really interesting uh, a case as well. I think that is a very nice program to share with the, all the audience today. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have uh, another question, uh, but actually um, the writer said it's for Professor Lyoko again, but I think uh, this question can be answered by the other speakers as well, since that is the overarching. How, how do you differentiate between historical revisionism and denialism in Japan's context? Uh, we have another Japanese, uh, another experts who studied uh, this Japanese issue. So maybe Professor Palmer, you can answer this if you want. And how do we access, uh, assess the cabinet's position that forced to work does not mean forced to labor and denying the existence of forced labor on the islands? What that amount to deny? Uh, would that amount to denialism? Such as, yeah. And lastly, how do you reconcile accepting of alternative historical narrative with narrative based on historical revisionism uh, or denialism in Japan? Well, this about the, you know this denialism and the historical revisionism. I think that is the main topic of session one. So maybe even you know Professor Joe, uh, who talked about the good revisionism and also bad revisionism at the same time, you can make comments as well. So, of course, Professor Yoko, you can do, yeah. Would, would you like to first? I, uh, okay, I, probably I didn't get all the questions um, correctly. Maybe um, I would be happy to pass over to other professors and maybe, yeah, that would be easier, right? Can, can you hear me? Um, I think in the case of Japan, that the term revisionism isn't necessarily entirely appropriate because Japan has never really revised its history. It's had the view regarding forced labor, the comfort women, that everything has been solved between Korea and Japan as a result of the 1965 peace treaty. They've had this position since the end of the occupation. It's a bit like the LDP being in power with the exception of a couple of years. And, and I just want to address a very important question, and it's very controversial, and it may ruffle some feathers here, but the reality is this is, and this relates to the keynote address, I think, which is that there's a politicization going on here, okay? It's not just about identity or attitudes, it's about political power. And political power has to return to the people, whether the Japanese or Korean or whatever. These sites also need to reflect the accuracy of the history based on evidence. What I try to do in my talk was I try to make it like evidence that is admissible in a court of law. And that evidence has to be corroborated, it has to be agreed on, and judged, okay? So, you know, this thing of multiple narratives regarding forced labor, I'm sorry, but Dave, Dave Runge lost his legs through torture, okay? There's not, there's not a question, and people died. That's not a question of, oh, well, Maybe it was this, maybe it was that. No, it was a crime, okay? What's interesting about the example that uh, Gerhard presented was that the German people and their government acknowledge this and so they move on. The Verstelpina Museum acknowledges that, the company accepts it, and they say, look, that's part of our past. From my accent, you can hear, I, I have an American accent. I'm a dual citizen, but I've lived in Australia for for 30 years, but the Americans have come to acknowledge the history of slavery. They have, they have a new holiday called Juneteenth, which is the liberation of slaves. So when countries acknowledge their history, they gain, they gain pride in themselves, they gain, um, you know, what can I say, you know? It, it, that's what Japan needs to do. They need to listen to 
the progressives in their own country because the, the, the World Heritage Sites will only change if it happens among the Japanese people saying, look, let's, let, let's acknowledge our history, that's all. Mm -hmm. So revisionism, um, no, I think they just need to accept corroborated evidence of what happened and move on. Thank you very much, Professor Palmer. Uh, Professor Joe, would you like to add a bit? Uh, yes. We, are, we have quite limited time, so in a short time, thank okay. you. So let me share my genetic idea on uh, the revisionism. We live in a quite inner contact, I mean, in a connected world. So if you focus on inward looking, or if you exclude other voices within your history, you may end up isolation. It is against your own interest, and it is against our uh, interest of the mankind. So I think, you know, uh, in this time, inward looking orientation or excluding other voices, uh, it is detrimental to the country and also to the world. This is my uh, genetic idea. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jo. <laughs> Thank you for the support. <laughs> Yeah, Professor Yoko, very briefly, and uh, I received one uh, request from the floor, uh, from the audience, as a last uh, question. So, first, briefly. Oh, okay, um, just briefly. It, well, um, in the context of Japan, I, I think there are, first of all, many different views about history, about World War Two, and uh, there is a kind of loose understanding among the, among the public that. Uh, you know, there was probably uh, people who were forced to work uh, under the Japanese occupation, and probably there were people who were, you know, forced to work as, you know, slaves, sex slaves, under the Japanese occupation. And I think in response, uh, there were historical revisionists uh, who tries to deny that, you know, that kind of understanding, or who want to say that it's exaggeration. So um, I think there is a wide range of um, discussion going on. But I do think actually in Japan, uh, there was a loose understanding that um, under the Japanese occupation, lots of terrible things happened. And uh, there were historical revisionists who tried to yeah, deny the exaggeration or whatever it is. So, yeah, that's my understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ryoko. Uh, I think, you know, that's why all experts are here today to say that uh, we need, you know, various open discussion to deal with this very difficult um, uh, issue. Um, and actually, there's a one request from the audience. Yeah. Could I have you? a, sh a yeah. short and easy question for Dr. Palmer. Um, in my looking at the different rosters at POW camps, I notice in the British rosters, um, a great number are Indian uh, troops. Do you know at Omuta how many of the British were actually Indian troops? That's a very good question. And part of the problem is that uh, what, what just amazed me was when I started looking into I initially looked at the, at the Nagasaki shipyard, okay? But because there were only a few Australians there, and there were, there were, there were not a lot of allied um, uh, prisoners there right in Nagasaki where, where the bomb was. Um, but in Mitsui, it was amazing. There were so many, it was a huge camp. And so I went through the Australian, uh, the National Archives of Australia, which has, which has digitalized all of the cards, the prisoner of war cards. It's an amazing collection. You can get it online. You can hear Dave Runge's in interview online. But what I, what I realized was we know so little about each of these individuals. What I discovered too, and it's in the article that I published in um, uh, Japan Focus, which is on uh, the, the Mitsui mine and the Australian POWs, is that um, Dave, and I didn't, act, I don't know if I actually include this, but, but Dave um, at one point was um, uh, in the hospital recovering from the amputation, and he was warned by one of the orderlies 
that um, the uh, top guards were coming and they were going to talk to him and isolate him and kill him. And um, he was uh, given an iron bar by one of the orderlies. And this orderly came from uh, Cherokee, Oklahoma. So I did, I, I tried to track it because I thought, well, did this, did this person have like a Native American background or, you know, and, I, and then I realized there were all of these uh, people with Mexican backgrounds that, that were uh, uh, allied POWs from the US, okay? So there's so much we don't know about the backgrounds of all these people. We, we're only beginning to even dig into this history. And it's all there, but it's like mountains of material that you have to go through, okay? And um, it's, it's very exciting to discover this history and the voices of these people, but there's so much we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, that, I totally back that up. And we aren't even aware, not only Mexican Americans, Native Americans, Alaskans, and Korean Americans, and Japanese Americans, absolutely. and Chinese Americans. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question and uh, your answer, Professor Palmer, as well. Uh, it seems, you know, uh, we got lots of inspiration today, saying that there are still so many untold stories and unheard, unheard stories. And uh, that's why we are all here you know, to talk about the past in this present and to go to the future together. So thank you very much for your uh, valuable uh, contributions today. And thank you all you uh, joined here in person. And uh, thank you our Zoom online participants. And uh, I will gonna have a very short, uh, sorry for the, this very limited time from the lunch, but, and uh, for some for, the, uh, for dinner. And I will see you uh, after 45 minutes, uh, 1 p.m. in New York time. Uh, for the second session, which uh, will be very interesting with the participation of young people. Thank you all again. See you soon. People online, I hope, are back as well. Uh, I'm Linda Norris, Senior Specialist for Methodology and Practice at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. I'm really sorry I'm not Liz Silks, who's not our director, who was going to be facilitating these sessions this afternoon, uh, and is ill and couldn't be here today. But I'm really excited to facilitate, uh, to introduce and then facilitate a session about the amazing work that Sites of Conscience do around the world. Jean-Louis introduced a little bit about Sites of Conscience this morning, because he's been involved a long time with us. But I wanted to talk a little bit more. Um, we are now more than 350 members in 65 countries around the world, thinking about every history, kind of history imaginable. And I think there's something really important to think about Sites of Conscience, which is to say, we are not prescriptive as an organization, but we are bound together by a set of values that inform our work. Uh, and most two of those values that are most important are one, we believe communities and those affected by the story that are being told are incredibly pe important people to have involved in the process, as we heard this morning in lots of different kinds of ways. And second, and most importantly, every side of conscience believes that history is a tool to create a more just future for everyone. That's the way all of us work. And so for this session, I want to introduce someone whose organization does amazing work in this direction. Uh, Lauren Zalut from Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia will be facilitating this session. Uh, Eastern State, you can read Lauren's bio in your program, but Eastern State is an organization that has made a really dedicated commitment to the idea that as a historic prison, rethinking and encouraging Americans to advocate for change in the American system of incarceration is critical work to be doing. So they have taken this idea of memory to action that is a part of coalition work and pushed it forward eternally. And also with all of our speakers this afternoon, I wanted to know a little more about them. So I've asked them each to share a site 
whether it's an actual site of conscience, one of our members, or somewhere else that they would want to know more about that is meaningful to them. And so for Lauren, uh, when I asked her at lunchtime, she said, well, it's Manzanar. <laughs> so uh, we're really pleased to have Lauren here and to facilitate this session where we hear from young people. And you'll get to hear more about Manzanar, Lauren's choice, later this afternoon. So Lauren, go ahead. Excuse me, please, next to slide. All right, good afternoon, and thank you, Linda, for that introduction, and thanks to Sites of Conscience for inviting me to be here today. Um, I got into this work to teach young people, and so I'm truly honored um, to be hosting and moderating this session, the Youth Roundtable, Interpretation of War Heritage and Participation of Future Generations. Um, so this session is all about listening to youth, understanding their role and influence on the conversation that we're having today about countering historical revisionism. We're gonna kick off this round table, which is gonna be super dynamic, um, with a short video. This includes youth from 10 sites of conscience from around the world in dialogue about historical revisionism. After that, we'll be joined by some of the youth who recorded videos via Zoom, and we'll also be joined by a panel of experts who are here in this room, some of whom we heard from in session one, and some of whom we're going to hear from in session three. Um, and so before we start the video, I just wanna remind the folks who are joining us online that um, sessions are being translated into multiple languages and you can choose your language on the bottom of the screen. If you're joining us online, remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. You can use the chat box or raise your hand if you have a question or comment. Um, we will have about a 40 minute panel discussion following the video and then we'll open it up to questions for about 30 minutes. And so with that, I'm gonna um, ask them to play the video for us. What advice can we tell our fellow friends who are not here about misinformation? I can tell I can tell them that they should not even judge someone or look straight about something that they have, to, they have been told before looking for the correct information. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will tell them that they will look for the information, they will confirm the information if it's true or if it is wrong before judging others.
Depuis un jeune âge, ce qui est appris dans le système scolaire n'est pas véridique de ce qu'on apprend plus tard en grandissant, surtout en ce qui concerne l'histoire de l'île Maurice. Afin d'enrichir notre compréhension des événements qui ont influencé notre réalité actuelle, il est nécessaire de mettre en avant les faits réels et justes. En tant que société, nous devons réévaluer notre relation avec l'histoire et remettre en question la manière dont ce passé nous est souvent enseigné. Cela nous offrira de nouvelles perspectives et nous permettra de découvrir la vérité sur les événements passés. Nazlı, ben Sibel, transfeminist bir LGBT artı aktivistiyim. Feminist, 25 yaşındayım, dansçıyım. Aynı zamanda sanat alanında üretim yapıyorum. TV toplumda çalışıyorum. Hafıza çalışmalarıyla ilgileniyorum çünkü deneyimi ve hafızası silinen bir politik özneyim. Ve devlet söylemine ve şiddetine karşı mücadeleyi hem aşırılamak hem de genişletmek için hafıza çalışmalarıyla ilgileniyorum. Çocukluktan beri okulda, evde, ailede ya da medyada birçok inkarcı söylemle karşılaşıyoruz. Kendi ailemde bir göç hikayesi var aslında. Benim kişisel tarihimden bir örnek ise 5-6 sene önce şans eseri iki Ermeni büyükannem olduğunu öğrenmem. Ee, ve ben bunu öğrendiğimde ve onlara sorduğumda üstünü örter gibi, kurcalama der gibi, soru sorma der gibi cevaplar alıyordum. Bu aslında e, toplumdaki bu inkarcı ve milliyetçi söylemin e, ailelere yansıması. Tarihsel revizyonizm kavramı Türkiye'de oldukça az kullanılıyor ve ben de bu kavramla yeni tanışıyorum aslında. Bunun en önemli sebebi egemenin e, tarih anlatısı yani resmi tarihin e, hali hazırda ırkçı, e, milliyetçi, e, siseteroseksist, ayrımcı e, ve inkarcı olması. Resmi tarihe karşı gelen, egemen söyleme karşı gelen hafıza çalışmaları da var. Bu çalışmalar sayesinde geçmişte yaşanan şiddetle ya da e, toplumsal travmalarla da yüzleşmeye Çalışıyoruz ya da yüzleşmek için adım atıyoruz diyebilirim. Hello everyone, my name is Noor Ahmed. I am an intersectional youth activist based here in Johannesburg. Um, and today we're kind of unpacking um, my information or what knowledge that I have about World War II. And um, the knowledge that I have is quite limited in a sense. And I only know what I was taught in school, which in, in of itself is... Um, something that we need to keep in mind that you know young people um, who are not interested in history are not actually going and researching um, what happened in our history um, and you know we're being sort of spoon-fed a specific perspective of history um, and you know we need to keep in mind and be critical of the kind of history that um, we know that we're learning and you know the history of Israel and, pa and Palestine is a prime example of that because you'll have what we're currently seeing happening in, in uh, Palestine is a rewriting of history um, by the oppressors to erase the presence of the oppressed um, so yeah and you know it's I don't know what else to say <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that as young people and as future leaders or leaders of, the, of our country and our community, we need to keep in mind that um, we are always critical and always engaging with the information that we receive, um, particularly information that uh, we are not directly impacted by or that we are not directly um, in contact with. So information that comes um, to us from, for example, um, the Ukraine, what's happening there, uh, we always have to be critical of the um, the way in which the media reports situations, um, you know, we saw a lot of discrimination and racism in the media um, in just in the way that the situation was being reported on where the media kept talking about these are um, these are white people with blue blue eyes and blonde hair, you know, and these are not things that were made up. These were actual direct quotes from the media. And I think when situations like these happen, the bias of the media really comes through. Um, and when in situations of conflict, we see that so sometimes our worst parts are, are brought forth. So we, there was a lot of discrimination against black people in Ukraine where they were forced to not uh, be able to get on the trains that were leaving the country um, while Ukraine was being attacked. So um, those are just some examples of why we always need to be very, very critical of the information that we are in contact with and um, always keep in mind that sometimes 
you know, history might not be what we are told it is. Qual è la differenza tra essere sul luogo e studiare l'evento su un libro? Noi le abbiamo sviluppate entrambe, infatti ognuno di noi a scuola ha scelto una vittima e attraverso il sito Storia e Memoria di Bologna eh, abbiamo studiato la vita e i percorsi eh, appunto di vita dei ragazzi eh, che hanno la nostra età eh, di Montesole. Siamo anche andati eh, sul campo eh, attraverso dei percorsi, attraverso la Scuola della Pace che ci ha fatto fare... Un bellissimo, un bellissimo progetto dove abbiamo sentito su pelle le esperienze, i rumori, gli odori eh, di quel posto. Sì, andare direttamente sul luogo credo che sia un'esperienza unica perché si sente veramente quello che è successo. E è uno studio molto personale e che ti porta emozioni incredibili che abbiamo provato tutti e credo sia un'esperienza appunto davvero unica. Anche perché per noi è stato fondamentale, perché appunto nel nostro corto abbiamo deciso di approfondire la vita di una ragazza che aveva la nostra età. Perciò quest'idea di entrare nel vivo del, della strage, degli avvenimenti, è stato eh, fondamentale per poi scrivere e girare anche il corto. Come l'esperienza della conoscenza sui luoghi può aiutare a contrastare il revisionismo storico? Allora, personalmente credo che ehm, siamo sempre stati abituati a vedere la storia come formata da buoni e da cattivi e grazie anche a questo lavoro che abbiamo fatto abbiamo capito che non ci sono buoni e cattivi, ci sono persone che eh, si comportano in base al contesto in cui sono, quindi ad esempio nei tedeschi c'era chi era disertore nei, nelle vittime c'era chi era d'accordo con uh, gli, gli ideali dei, dei tedeschi. C'è del buono nel cattivo e del cattivo nel buono, quindi non ci sono son concetti definiti. Sì, infatti per esempio anche noi abbiamo messo una scena eh, in cui c'è il nonno di Lucia, cioè Anzarini, che eh, spiega che appunto c'è un, un tedesco eh, disertore nel fienile che non è più né, né buono né cattivo perché se lo trovano gli italiani eh, chiaramente lo, lo ucciderebbero, se lo trovano i tedeschi eh, lo uccidono comunque e quindi sì penso che questo, questo discorso che ha fatto Sofia sia veramente bello. شكل بالتاريخ يعني من وقت اول شيء كانت اسمها ساحة البرج لما تحولت لصالة بلاس دي بانو دونك هلا بنشوفها بنمرق فاضي فيها هيك بنحس انه بشعور كمان يأس لما بنمرق منها لانه نحن ما بنعرف عنها ومرق كثير عليها تاريخ طويل ونحن ما بنعرف شيء نزلت الثورة وجسد شيء جديد هلا اللي بعرفه عن اهلنا انه دائما بيحكوا لنا عن كيف كانت ساحة الشهداء وشو كان ال كيف كان المجتمع البيروتي بوقته وكيف تغيرت من بعد الحرب وتغيرت تحديدا من بعد المشاريع اللي اللي انعملت من بعد الحرب فهذا الشيء نوعا ما اشرطها هويته ومن بعد كل المظاهرات اللي صارت هونيك كانه رجع نوعا ما لها هويه معينه انا بلاقي موقع كثير استراتيجي هو شيء جيوغرافيكمون بارلان هي على مدخل بيروت هيدا ديجا دو باز كثير اساسي وبعد ما تحس على هذا الموضوع بعدين ما لازم ننسى اذا بدنا نحكي باللين دو ديماركاسيون انه هي عن جد هو الخط مش بس الفرق بين حقول المناطق المسيحية والمناطق المسلمة كيف كانت منصمة بيروت شرقية غربية شرقية غربية بس كانت كمان الموضوع انه فيها تكون خط تماس بس فيها كمان تكون خط الفرق Pour avoir lu quelques recueils de témoignages sur le Camboaro Lorsque j'entends parler du Camboaro cela m'évoque beaucoup de tristesse euh, beaucoup de massacres s'y sont passés, des droits, les, les droits de l'homme euh, y ont été complètement bafoués. Euh, il y a eu des massacres euh, collectifs. Que oui, on doit garder euh, le camp à l'état initial parce que cela permet de garder une partie de l'histoire de la Guinée. 
Et ça permet surtout de rendre hommage aux personnes victimes de ce camp Boiro. Türkiye'de hafızalaştırma web sayfasını hafıza merkezinin gençlik projesine katıldığımda görmüştüm. Bence çok iyi bir platform ve arşiv kaynağı. Bu alanda yapılan çalışmaların farklı alanlardan, farklı disiplinlerden olan çalışmaları bir yere topluyor olmaları benim gibi farklı bir branşta okuyan ama bu alanda ilgi duyan ve çalışmak isteyen biri için ilham verici ve ufuk açıcı olabiliyor diye düşünüyorum. Türkiye'de hafızalaştırma platformunda beni en etkileyen örneklerden biri de Anıt Sayar. Ee, yine bu web sayfasında beni e, daha derinden etkileyen diyebileceğim mekan ve proje aslında 23.5 Ranting hafıza mekanı oldu. Bence devlet şiddeti ve erkek şiddetinin nasıl birlikte ve iç içe olduğunu ve birbirine desteklediğini gözler önüne serebiliyor. Anıt Sayaç, kadın cinayetlerini e, arşivleyen bir platform. Yaşayan bir yer olduğunu düşünüyorum. Hafıza mekanlarına dair çok farklı bakış açıları öğrenmek, dünya üzerindeki farklı e, mekanları öğrenmek bana iyi gelmişti. Eleştirel hafıza çalışmaları ya da vicdan mekanlarının önyargı ve ayrımcılıkla mücadelede çok önemli bir yeri var çünkü bir bilgiyi e, ezbere öğrendiğimiz bir eğitim sisteminden geliyoruz ve aslında bedensel olarak öğrenmek, bebeğimizin duygularını tanımak ve onları tanımlamak üzerine çok da bir şey öğretilmiyor aslında. Ya özellikle bizim coğrafyamızda e, geçmişle yüzleşme yaşanmadı. Geçmişteki travmalar, toplumsal travmalar, soykırımlar ya da e, şiddetler e, geriye bakılıp telafi edilmedi ya da kabul bile edilmedi. Yani bu gibi çalışmalar, bu gibi hafıza mekanları ve vicdan mekanları sayesinde e, insanlar tırlamanın bir sorumluluk olduğunu fark edebiliyor. En tant que site de conscience, le musée intercontinental de l'esclavage doit être un lieu où il sera capable de démystifier ce passé qui est souvent erroné dans les livres scolaires, avec des recherches factuelles qui permettront à tout un chacun de discuter de cette histoire sans tabou. Pouvant agir en tant que médiateur afin de conscientiser les sociétés concernant la discrimination, les préjugés et la révision historique à être abordée, les sites de conscience ont un rôle à jouer. Voir l'histoire en face d'une manière dépassionnée, La promotion d'une psychologie décoloniale doit être aussi promulguée. Les sites de conscience ont une chance de créer la conversation pour tout un chacun et donner une main à ces lieux qui sont un pas vers un avenir plus juste. Mais ce travail doit se faire avec les différents partenaires afin d'apprendre et se détacher de ce passé qui a très souvent façonné le présent d'une manière délétère. Uh, how are you, does violence affect children, pupils? Yes. yes. Were you affected as pupils? Yes. How were you affected? Many will become orphans. Many will be becoming orphans. People won't get education because of fear. People won't get education because of fear. What do you want to tell you from other tribes about Kisumu? I can tell you that Kisumu is a good place and a good town. And it has many resources. Though, so if they want to come, they just come and feel at home, away from home. So we, as the youth, we can explore a number of strategies. One by making use of technology through documenting the accounts of victims of such violations, and by doing that, we shall be able to raise awareness about the problem. Then we shall also be able to emphasize memorization through memorization projects. And then we also intend to demand for accountability for such violations in our country. For our participation as youths, as young people, to see that uh, we do not become victim, uh, victims of circumstance again. لازم الشعب يعطي كمان رأيه بالموضوع 
موضوع لانه عادة التاريخ بينكتب من السلطة بينكتب من الاشخاص اللي هي الاساسية او هي الفوكس بوينت عليهم بس في نوع من التاريخ يعني هو نحن اخذناه كمان وبلشنا اكثر نسمع فيه بلبنان هو اوريدي كان موجود بامريكا وكثير متطور وحتى بيوروب يلي هو التاريخ المروي وخاصة بكل التناقض اللي نحن عايشين فيه بلبنان ومع تعدد وجهات النظر نحن هلا هلا عم نعمل هلا محاربة ميزانيزم دو فاكتو انا قادرين اقعد مع اراء مختلفة يعني كل واحد عنده راي غير الثاني قادرين نحكي بالموضوع وبكل رواء وبكل عم نطلع من المواقف كمون مجرد نجمع القصص اللي صاروا وعم نحارب الميزانيزم القصص هلا عم نعملها بالديسكسيون تاعتنا بقعدتنا تي كوموس اتخلي للمواضع تصير اتخنال ضلها موجوده اشرف انقاد انه هذا هون موجود انا فيني انزل اتذكر انه انا من مطالبي المطالب اللي عندي ما اختفت ما نسيت العالم اللي ماتت ما انتسيت بعدها مذكره بعدهم هن مش بس بقلب اهلهم بس هن كمان صار بقلب الكل بعدهم مساج كمان موجود عندي كم مواقف كومون كي بقى اتخيه يعني حيصير انه مواقف كومون كي فيها تبلش هذه الانيتي اللي بيناتنا اللي كانت Simplement, ils avaient dit que le mouvement est une unité effective et éternelle. Il faut que dans le temps. Là, nous avons fait le mal de mémoire. Parce que nous avons fait le mal de mémoire. 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 Nous avons Silenzio assordante. Speranza. Crescita. So um, let's give it up again for all those amazing young people from all over the world. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to start assembling our in-person panel and we're going to start letting into the Zoom room any youth who have joined us or folks from sites around the world who work with youth, they're going to join us on Zoom. So forgive us while we do a little bit of setup. Just want to lift up some things that I noticed in the video, and maybe that, that stuck out to you. Um, young people talking about, we have an obligation to remember. Young people talking about just the act of being in dialogue, which is so core to being a site of conscience, as a way to counter historical revisionism. Um, that someone who doesn't know history has no identity and that we have to question the history that we are taught. And so this, these are the things that young people that I know that I work with in Philadelphia here in the US, I hear this a lot when I'm on tour with folks and we're hearing it from all over the world, that it's critical that we tell the truth. And that's a lot of what we heard in our first session today too. So I'm gonna ask um, that our panelists start to make their way up to the stage. Our panelists from session one, Professor Palmer, Professor Lenz, Professor Rayoko, and then we also have some panelists from our final session who are gonna be joining us on stage. Um, Rose, Lelia, and Benjamin, come on up and find your seat. We're getting it all set up for you. And my tech folks, how are we doing with our Zoom guests?
can hear me. <laughs> I have a lot of mics. All right. So while we wait for folks on Zoom to join, I think what I'll do is, um, because we haven't met everybody in the panel, um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start over here. And we're all going to answer the same question. So please introduce yourself, your affiliation, who you're here representing today, um, and how you first became aware of historical revisionism. How you first became aware of historical revisionism. For me, it's a lot of what I'm hearing today. Like this is all new for me, and I'm just in awe of all the people that are gathered here. So that, that's my answer. Is it, do I go first? Yeah, do it, Rose. Okay. Um, my name is Rose Masters. I am a national park ranger at Manzanar National Historic Site in California. And um, the way I first became aware of historical revisionism um, was by starting to work at Manzanar as a 17-year-old. A lot of the um, conversations in the community I grew up in, just six miles from Manzanar National Historic Site, were um, quite uh, revisionistic in the bad way. Uh, and I didn't necessarily recognize that as such until I was somebody who was um, working at the site and discovering the actual truth of what happened there from the people who um, spent World War II incarcerated there. Thanks, Rose. And we'll go ahead to you, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Lelia Perez Valdez. I come from Chile and uh, I belong to Association of Memory and Human Rights Colonia Dignidad. Well, the thing with negationism and revisionism is it's a little bit uh, difficult to talk about that uh, because to negate something, that thing has to exist. Exist, we can say yes or we can say no. And uh, the history of the Second World War in Chile and most of all of the, the Latin American countries have only one voice, which was the winner of the, <laughs> yeah? So uh, I can say that so negationism exists since the beginning, the early beginning. The point is when we were aware of that, and when we started to understand that history can have different points of view and different um, interpretations, and uh, that the, the winner of that um, Second World War, that for me was a European war, but uh, we, were, uh, we know that as a world war. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we became part of this um, part of the world who did not participate, but we received the consequences a lot. And the main consequence we received in Latin America was the Cold War. And Latin American countries were uh, named, labeled like uh, the backyard of the United States. So uh, it's humiliating uh, the, to be Latin American and we talk about the negationism or we talk about uh, the Second World War. It's, it's, for that reason, you know, this is quite complicated. It's really complicated uh, because what existed was uh, the discourse, the narrative from the winners, especially from the United States. So uh, it has been a long way to understand that uh, there are other, other voices, other way to see. We didn't participate, we would pay the bill. Thank you, thank you. You wanna go next? Do I have just to speak in the mic? Yeah, it's on? Cool. Uh, so my name is Benjamin and, and I was actually born in France but I work in Brazil so I'm representing today a place called Casa do Povo, which uh, in English would go for the people's house. Mm. Um, and it's very exciting to be here and to hear uh, all of you guys. And uh, I guess uh, the first time I heard about revisionism, in fact, was in my childhood uh, uh, in the French context when people were questioning uh, the Shoah, the Holocaust, right? Mm. And then the second time I heard about revisionism, I think, was in high school when we kind of 
studied um, a people's history by Howard Zinn mm -hmm. and the way that uh, uh, American history was revisited. Mm -hmm. So it, and it came in a positive context. And um, so for me, revisionism, as it was said this morning, is a complex concept or maybe an empty concept. I'm not sure because it's, it has to be somehow uh, um, modulated to understand what we're talking about. And I usually prefer to talk about denialism, which I think is, uh, is more relevant and less relative regarding uh, the way we look at history. Uh, because we're not talking about revisionism, I think we're talking about uh, uh, denialism, and I hope to talk about this later on. So thank you, and I'm happy to hear all of you. Thanks, and we'll go ahead over here to you next. Yeah. My name is Gerd. I think, I think you've, you've seen me this morning. We're happy to see you again. Exactly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a very difficult question because revisionism means uh, I, no, I will say, in my opinion, we have different forms of revisionism. As I'm an historian, I realize the first phases of revisionism in the Federal Republic of Germany in the 1950s, for example. You have the revisionism to talk about the Second World War and to say, oh, it was not so bad, for example, or you can hear the sentence, oh yes, Hitler, Hitler killed the Jewish people, only Hitler, but he also built the motorways, for example, was a special example. So you, they tried to get a new narrative concerning the Second World War uh, and the so-called Third Reich. Then we have a new discussion in Germany, as I explained it, in the 17th and the 18th and at the beginning of the 19th to create new society after the fall of the Iron Wall, for example. And now we have a new revisionism in Germany, and it's on the one hand a result of the fall of the Iron Wall and of the not successful integration of some parts of the Eastern German society. And also, it's, I think there is a second reason. Uh, all people want to be connected with the whole world. They want to be connected, but they won't, don't want to be connected with the social and economical and ecological problems. And so if they were connected with the problems, they think they lose their identity, for example. They are in fear of losing their identity. They are in fear of losing their special history. And so they come to the conclusion that there are no different narratives that there, that there might exist different narratives of history, and they come to the conclusion that there is only one narrative, their personal, the narrative of their group. So it's a real revisionistic point to tell about the whole history of one's own country, a new story, without looking at different story. And I think that's the danger. I think different narratives can exist if none of it says, oh, it's the only truth I belong to. And that's the question now. And also we have uh, political revisionism in Germany, as you know, the new party, the or new, the RFD. And I was very, very deeply impressed when they said that the Holocaust monument in Berlin was a place of shame. But they don't mean that it was a place of shame of our history but it was a place of shame for us, and that's really, that's really very bad words in a modern society. Many, many layers. I appreciate that. Professor Ryoko? Oh, do you have a mic? Okay. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Ryoko Nakano. Um, I'm a professor at Kanazawa University. Um, I specialize in international relations. I'm not a historian. Um, so I, I think when I was a university student, you know, when I was 18 or 19, I first came across the word historical revisionism, and it's basically in a negative way. Um, so I, I think one politician in Japan um, also said that there was no Nanjing massacre. I think that's the first kind of, you know, statement that really hit me. And then around that time, there was also a history textbook issue in Japan. So, you know, whether a history textbook should describe Nanjing incident as a Nanjing massacre or, you know, just an incident. 
um, also whether textbooks should include comfort women or not, how much, and that kind of things becomes a matter of discussion. And uh, um, I think uh, I, I recognize that there was a school of people who tries to argue that, well, there was no comfort women, no forced labor, and uh, you know some uh, some of the um, yeah descriptions of the history of these things uh, kind of fabricated or exaggerated by Koreans and Chinese, and yeah, that that is the first time I really thought that uh, this is a serious problem. Thank you. Thanks. And before we get get to you, Professor Palmer, I just want to welcome all of our folks who have joined us here on Zoom. I know those of us on stage, we can't see you, you're behind us. But um, we'll turn to you after Professor Palmer goes, and I'm just asking you, um, hi, I'm Lauren, and I'm just asking everybody participating to introduce themselves, um, talk about your affiliation, so who are you representing today, and also, how did you first become aware of historical revisionism? Okay, Professor Palmer, go for it. Well, um, kind of most of my uh, life, I've been a devil's advocate, so I'm gonna do it again. Uh, I look at it differently, okay? Like, this word revisionism, where is it, what's the root of that? Revise, okay? Now, having grown up in the United States, um, what I found was that a lot of history wasn't revised, it was never there. Yeah. It was, it was buried, okay? Like, I was shocked to learn of the diversity of Native Americans, all of the people. I was on land, I was living on land of the Potawatomi, okay? I was living, I, you know, the, the, People had once lived on this land who were the, the original owners of that land, right? Then later, <clears throat> reading on my own, won't go into a lot of stuff, but uh, I discovered W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American scholar, and he wrote a book called Black Reconstruction. And what Du Bois found, not, not, this man was amazing because he was the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard. He was brilliant. He studied with William James. He was fluent in German and studied in Germany. He wanted to become a philosophy professor, and he was refused a job everywhere. So he went off on his own and became a pioneer of sociology. And what he discovered was that the, the true story of black reconstruction, of the liberation of African-Americans after the victory of the Civil War over the slaveocracy. It had never been told properly. And then, I, after I graduated from university, I, I got into labor organizing, going to factories, you're gonna change the world and all that. And then I discovered there's more I didn't know. There was more buried history. So I did oral histories of, of American shipyard workers, wrote a book on that. Then I moved to Australia, get a job, start a new life, you know, immigrant. A lot of people do that. Uh, I was privileged. I was a lucky guy. I could do it. Um, a lot of people don't have that privilege. And then I started uh, going up to uh, Japan to interview workers there. And I discovered another thing, that, that the whole history of Koreans in Japan, it was unrecognized. And then I realized, well, I've really got to look into the history of Korean forced labor. And so for me, it's a, it's a question of discovering the history that the elites have tried to bury. That's the people's history that they deserve to know, and our job is to bring it to them. And as young people, never blame a young person, never blame a student, because they, you know, they're not in charge of the world, right? So, us of the older generation, it's our job to dig up that history and to communicate it and find out what the young people want to know. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Professor Palmer. And I think that we have this amazing, like, I want to like turn around and look at you. Um, this incredible group that's assembled here today um, who's joining us on Zoom. So, um, voila, do you mind going first and just let us know who you're representing today? 
Um, and when you first encountered this idea of historical revisionism, and feel free to, to disagree with things that we've heard today. <laughs> Uh, yes, of course. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you. Uh, so I'm Wala Farran, a researcher at the organization Act for the Disappeared in Lebanon. Uh, it's a human rights organization that supports the families of the missing uh, in order to clarify the fight, uh, the, the fate of the thousands who uh, went missing during the Lebanese civil war. So I was newly introduced to uh, this notion. Uh, I know uh, by a historian, actually. Um, I understand this notion as when history is revised, but I find this uh, very um, complex in the Lebanese context because um, in Lebanon, um, in order to revise history, we should already at least have a written national history in the country, but this isn't the case in Lebanon, as Lebanon is a very complex society with uh, different sects. And um, our history books stop at 1943, which is the independence of Lebanon. And it says nothing about the Lebanese civil war that happened between 1975 and 1990. So um, the history we hear is just oral nar narrative, um, more like revisionism by the political parties uh, that have uh, different history narratives. So everyone has a different uh, history. Uh, and uh, these stories that they keep saying are constantly changing. So everyone says a different story to suit his uh, own political agenda. So we don't uh, actually have a written history. So I think this is uh, an issue in our context. Thanks, Wala. And um, Dennis, do you mind going next for us? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm Dennis Ndala. I work with the Manene Cultural Trust in Kenya. Uh, okay. For me, uh, the first time uh, uh, getting to learn about the word uh, revisionism was uh, when I was doing my studies of philosophy of history and uh, philosophy of religion and mission. Uh, so by that time, as young people learning about uh, now the history of the nation as it's being taught and exactly what is recorded in the books. And now when now people are now analytically saying exactly the narratives that are there in the villages uh, is when now I got to the word revisionism on how the history was being told depending on the interest of the writer and more so uh, the one who funded the research, for instance, uh, even in religion, because now is when we were questioning uh, if we had the imperialists, the colonizers, how would they have colonized the empires and uh, which were existing in Africa? And if, and how could an empire exist with people who doesn't have knowledge? And we get now the anthropologists uh, writing about the Africans who are tabula rasa, who are empty. So we, it is that time when I got this word first of uh, uh, revisionism of the history of religion and also of the nation. And later now in our work, uh, now more happens when now even the actual history of the state cannot be taught. People are being made to believe in denialism where we deny what happens and, and even the students are being encouraged to forget what recently happened so that we can forget and move on so that we don't look back. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dennis. And I'm gonna turn it to our last panelist um, from Italy, we have Stefano. Hi. It's uh, Stefano and Elena, actually, for the Peace Code. And uh, nice to be here. So for me personally, it's very hard to find a precise moment. Uh, as you will find out in the next session, when we will talk about Italy, uh, the situation here is um, complex, if not complicated. 
let's say that the memory that I can share is that once when I was in my probably, I was maybe 12, 13 years old, uh, I had an, a kind of a fight, an argument with, a, with another kid that was my age because he was drawing a swastika. And so I started to complain. I said, what are you doing? And he said, uh, yeah, but they, are, they were the good guys and the fascist even more. And I said, oh, but mm, what are you saying? They were the evil ones. My grandfather was a partisan. He fought, he was on the right side in the war. And he said, no, then he was a traitor if he was a partisan because true Italy is the fascist Italy. And that's an example of <laughs> the situation that uh, what can happen in, in this country when you talk about uh, the responsibilities of Second World War and uh, revisionism. Well, as to me, I would say it's more about untold stories uh, because, uh, yeah, for a very long time, I mean, until quite recent times, for instance, history school books had a very um, Italy-centered narrative, <laughs> especially as far as concerns period like, uh, I don't know, Middle Ages and so on. So you had to uh, re you had to read terms like I don't know Arab invasion, but of course it was Roman expansion, like it was somehow justifiable. Um, so all this kind of uh, uh, I mean the way history was described was of course very ethnocentric. And uh, I realized that quite uh, at a very young age, to be honest. So um, as to recent past, I mean, the history of uh, fascism, revisionism has always been there, to be honest, in Italy. So uh, you have to, like I say, you face this um, on a daily basis, basically. Yeah, and I think that we heard that from a lot of different panelists today, right? That there was an early encounter in somebody's life where they, you know, recognized this concept. And then in the case of many of the people um, who are assembled here today, it became a lifelong pursuit, right? Um, realizing that there was um, something missing from what they had learned about history, right? And so I really want to center um, the voices of our panelists who are joining us on Zoom, who are youth or work with youth on a regular basis. And I want to ask um, the group assembled on Zoom, how do you think young people should be involved when it comes to interpretation of war heritage? And um, you can unmute yourself if you feel ready to answer. Hard to read the room with my back to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, where are you? Okay. So, yeah, go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, well, to begin with, um, the youth of today is being told stories from like more than 75 years ago. But still, uh, I mean, somehow the heritage of World War II is really present. What we try to do at the Peace School is to work on um, single biographies uh, in a frame of uh, history studies, which is called in this area. I mean, it's very popular. It was very popular in Italy and France, and it's called micro history. Basically, you study the story of individuals, but always in uh, like with a broader picture. Uh, the historical broader picture. Um, so for instance, what happened with the uh, youth uh, we have seen in the, in the video was that they came here on the site and on the site, we read uh, the testimonies of survivors. So they listened to those testimonies already on site. And of course they developed uh, a certain emotional uh, approach to it, which of course, uh, um, it's not the end of our work because uh, that kind of emotion of compassion, they feel that empathy 
should be also uh, be um, together with uh, uh, reflections as well. So what are some of the ways that you help youth like move through those emotions when they're working on um, those projects? Uh, basically, what we do is um, after the visit, which is very powerful, um, after the lunch break, what we do is to try to uh, express, verbalize, and elaborate those emotions. But then we also need to move on a little bit. Um, when you visit a mammary site, the compassion for the victim is uh, something quite immediate. But uh, at one point, somebody realizes that uh, we should take you should take into consideration also the perpetrators, not because we need to justify them, of course, but uh, analyzing. Um, what brought the, the perpetrators to such a violence could be really helpful in order to detect mechanisms and to prevent them. Thank you. Walla and Dennis, um, how do you think young people should be involved when it comes to interpretation of war heritage? Does one of you feel ready to answer? Walla? Yes, I am gonna answer. Uh, okay, uh, so I think uh, the best way for youth to be engaged uh, in this is through oral history. Uh, this way they can um, listen to different stories of different events of the war, uh, especially those of the victims. Um, and as, uh, as mentioned, the perpetrators as well. So that's what we do at Act for This Appeared. We listen to different stories told by the victims as well as the perpetrators. Uh, so this, because in Lebanon, uh, the only stories that the youth know are those that their parents uh, tell them. Uh, because as I said before, that we don't have a history book, it's not taught in schools. So uh, this, uh, so through oral history, it's important to engage them. And Dennis? Yes, uh, uh, on how youth uh, can be engaged is uh, by acknowledging the most recent uh, events, uh, the recent past events. Uh, through that acknowledgement, then they are able now to move uh, to the past, to the forgotten past, in a way that each event is being acknowledged as, as how it happened is being uh, unpackaged for them. For instance, now uh, for us, uh, since we are using heritage, uh, people's heritage to promote peace and social cohesion. So uh, by so using heritage, then we focus more on listening to people's perspective, stories and angles of which are there. Then at the same time now, we focus on using art and music as a tool for uh, cultural diplomacy in a way that when they start now expressing this, they listen to the stories, they can act the stories, then they make the dramas out of them. But through that, they find now, they find a way of raising their voices to ask even their elders uh, more deeper questions of analyzing the situations. So uh, as for us, like in Kenya, where history is being denied because uh, even people are not being taught even the history of the nation, because of the power that history has, someone who is empowered by knowing whatever happened in the past. So with us as a cultural organization, we have taken that step of now engaging youth to start acknowledging the most recent events uh, and unpackaging how it affected them. Then now we move backwards. Am I... My next question, like you've already answered a lot of other questions that I was thinking about asking the group. And I'm thinking about what are the opportunities in presenting divergent or contested memories in sites of conscience and, conscience and heritage sites? Because I'm hearing a lot of people on this panel and 
on the Zoom call talking about, you know, information not being shared. It almost sounds like intentionally, right? That the history is not being shared purposefully. So what are the opportunities for sites of conscience in presenting divergent or contested memories? Like how do we, how do we have these many layers? And this question seems to be resonating with you here. So do you wanna, you wanna answer first? <laughs> yeah. So big panel today. So first I would say I have no answer at the moment, but, yeah. but um, you were nodding. The, the, I think the difficulty is, just look at the little, when we saw the film, yeah. the young people say that it's, they, they talk about knowledge of history first, yeah. and they talk about getting information, and they talk about to be upset if they get correct information. Mm. One example was the Ukraina, for example. So it's uh, very difficult for, for us and even for young people to decide between information, historical knowledge, face news, and actual knowledge. I think it's very difficult for them to yeah. decide. But if you want to come to a conclusion for yourself, you need knowledge and you need, um, you know, I would say you need real information. You need, um, you have to trust information. And if you can't trust information, uh, then you have fake news and you have individual narratives, a world of individual narratives concerning the whole world. And that makes one, me, myself, and I think others too, a little bit crazy in the head. So you, you can't decide to whom you belong and you can't decide how you will decide for yourself concerning the history. I think that's, that's uh, the real problem to, um, to decide about information and to have knowledge about the history to combine it with actual information because the f best thing against fake news is knowledge, of course, but how can you get knowledge if you live in a world of fake news? That's uh, difficult. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I think the, the critical thinking piece is also, you know, what I'm hearing from you, that you have to, you have to like our, our youth said, you have to question the history you are taught in many contexts. So other thoughts from the panel um, on opportunities in presenting divergent or contested memories in these spaces? sites of conscience and heritage sites. Rose. Is, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're I, think, I think a lot of people have touched on this already, but um, I feel like I'm a big proponent for making oral history available when possible. Um, obviously keeping in mind the wishes of the narrators, but um, I, I do think that um, presenting these contested histories through first-person narratives um, and making them available for people to research um, from wherever they are on different internet archives is a really important step in making sure people can actually have um, resources for learning critical thinking, um, oral histories, um, primary documents. Um, I, I think that the uh, digitization of archives um, that we've seen in the last 10, 15 years um, helps bring to the fore a lot of uh, contested history that before um, perhaps was a little bit hard to find information about. Um, and it's making it possible for young people to do their own research, to learn um, critical thinking skills, um, to hear those uh, primary narratives. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would, I would say. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my thought. I think it, you did answer my question, and I think you also connected back to something that Walla talked about. So Walla, you mentioned oral histories when you were talking originally. Can you say more about your experience with oral histories and um, you know, if 
if in the group that you're working in at your site, were other young people drawn to those materials and um, like what, what were compelling tools for learning history in your project? Yes, yes. Uh, oral history um, has been considered by the youth as more like a credible source of information. They consider uh, oral history to be uh, more credible than the history they have been reading. So now those who were present during the Lebanese war, are, uh, Lebanese war are actually in their 60s, 70s. So doing projects to talk to these people, to listen about the stories they uh, had, the events they faced during uh, the Lebanese war. So they can have a better understanding of what happened during the war. I think um, this um, helped the youth have their own uh, perspective of things because they, they listened to the stories passed to them from uh, the older generation. But now when they listen and hear uh, the stories uh, from different perspectives, different uh, regions, uh, in Lebanon, uh, then this helps um, build their uh, their thoughts, I believe. And Benjamin, I, I could feel like you maybe had something to share on this. Am I right? I'm giggling. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, thank you, Lauren. No, I, I was just wondering, many different thoughts went through my mind as I was listening to, to everyone, uh, many different directions. and. Um, when we talk about um, um, revisionism and, and et cetera, I, I often have the impression that we're talking about a kind of binary point of view. Like mm. if there was like if there were like two kind of uh, 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 narrative, you know, one narrative and, and then there's a counter narrative. And what I think is interesting is to look at when we talk about multiple narrative is also to be able to kind of draw some some red lines. Uh, some boundaries, and of course, I think they're definitely based on the idea of how knowledge is built. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, in, in historical truth. Maybe we can put it in plural, but I, I do believe uh, that there are methodologies, uh, there, there are uh, fake news, which means there are also uh, uh, right news. I don't know how you would call that. Uh, proper news. Real news. news. Real news. Sure. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting like, to put some clear boundaries also uh, regarding uh, this idea of narratives, multiple narratives, counter narratives. And then when you look at multiple narratives, to understand that also multiple narratives are not always, let's say, the narratives of the enemy, to put it in a very uh, uh, clear way, because we're also talking about that. Uh, and for anyone who's interesting in Kazlupovo, the place I'm working at, um, is that the place is somehow unsolved. Uh, we are uh, uh, a place that is um, somehow divided around multiple narratives. I mean, we have in this Jewish leftist uh, institution built in the 40s, for instance, uh, non-Zionist, anti-Zionist, leftist Zionist point of views, and they coexist, or maybe they don't coexist, but at least they're unsolved. And, and, and I would say that the state of our building, which is kind of, it's a ruin somehow, uh, our building, it's like really not as well taken care of as the Rubin Museum, uh, is an image of this unsolved narrative. And I kind of like yeah. also that, not to, to, not to try and always solve it, but understand that they, things can live together in an unsolved way within also clear boundaries. Otherwise, we, we, we open doors to, to any kind of, knowledge production, and I, and, I, and I believe we have to be quite rigorous about that. I, everything is not possible to be said. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, I think you're, you're yes. provoking the group. It's awesome. Oh, well, uh, yes, the, the red line you said. Um, oh, that, that's the point. Um, to, for example, I, I um, an ex-former uh, prisoner, political prisoner, and uh, in Chile, they cannot deny that torture and killing existed. So what the right-wing uh, people do? What were you doing there? Why were you doing? Why were you arrested? You know, so, oh, because I belong to a social movement? Ah, they say. So it's perfect. I mean, it's clear. You were taken, 
you were tortured because you were left it. Shit. Yeah, so uh, it's, 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 uh, what's the red line? You know, this is um, the, the right wing people are very fast, you know, very fast in moving their uh, red lines. At the beginning, they say no, no crimes. They say in Chile there was a war. After that, they proved there was not war. So, okay, just maybe there were some excess, you know, maybe some uh, cops or some soldiers committed a little excess, killing 3,000 people, a little excess. Uh, 40,000 people torture is a little excess. When, when they say, okay, the number, you know, 40,000, and that um, the, the, the Truth um, Commission yeah. uh, said, and no, well, it was well, not a little excess, yes, and then appear, you know, the, the chief of the army, the commander, they say, okay, we have to recognize that there were some problems, you know, in the history, but we have to look to the future. Just, uh, they didn't say clearly, forget the past, but they appear with the, this other concept that is reconciliation. And uh, I understand that people speak a lot about reconciliation and they feel very well about it. Say, oh, I'm a person that I want to uh, propose and impulse the reconciliation, but me, no. Because reconciliation for us means forgiveness, impunity, so the criminals can walk, you know, and no uh, judgment, nothing clear, blank. That's uh, the meaning for us of reconciliation. And if you are not reconciliating to the others, so we became the bad guys. Mm. You know, because we don't want to forgive. Forgive what? Forgive what? Who? Because they are hiding the information. Who did what to whom? So they ask, for example, uh, a blank check, you know? Uh, I don't know if, I, if uh, the, the right uh, expression. Carte blanche. That, is what yeah, you're you know that yeah. I, I, I have to sign a, a blank paper, and they are going to fill that. So this is going to be forgiveness for this and for that and for that. I, I am not ready to forgive anybody, because they are still missing people. My friends, my uh, sisters, my brothers are missing. You know, so no reconciliation from that point of view from that point of view. Uh, so when we say red line, for example, not, um, we cannot deny that people were killed. Yeah, but they were communists, they were this and that. So uh, that is one point. The other point is uh, this, um, when you say critical thinking, oh guys, you are talking, you know, education here, but in Chile, we have education here. The movement of uh, students in 2006, we call them penguins. You know, why? Because the uniform is blue and they wear, you know, white blou blouses and they are always in groups. And what they were asking, they were asking for public uh, education with quality. That movement, grew up and appeared again in 2011. And what was the say, the, what they say? Quality in education. But there is some hope. Those guys now are in the government. So Boric, this is my president, belonged to that movement. Yes, but um, critical thinking, oh, I hope that I, I, in this moment in Chile, I just want the education allow the students to understand what they are reading, you know, because during the last uh, uh, right-wing government, they take out from the public education philosophy, wow. they take out, they wanted to take out history, wow. they wanted to take, uh, take out sports, you know, and the last movement in, in Chile, the guys were running and they say, okay, you take out sports out of the programs, now are, we are running. You wanted to take out, you know, history, but we will not forget. So, I don't know, I mean, when I listen to you, this, I'm listening a dream, 
but the reality, the reality slap our faces. Can I, can I uh, sure. make a comment? Sure. Um, I agree with you on that reconciliation. I mean, the real issue is what happened in the history and acknowledgement. But I wanted to pick up on a point that Dennis raised, which I think is very important, okay? Which is in conveying history, what is the role of music and art? Uh, young people, they learn from music, the lyrics. You know, you look at every major movement of change and music is there, art is there, you know? And uh, just, just the case of uh, African Americans, you know, the whole, you know, everything from the blues to the civil rights songs to hip hop, you name it. I mean, I'm talking about the good stuff, but also art. If we look at the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, the documentation of that history is best, not through photography of all the buildings that were destroyed later, but by the drawings of the survivors themselves, the hibaksha that showed the terror that, that they experienced from that atomic bombing. So I think, you know, I, I'd, I'd be really interested in, in comments from, um, from you people uh, online there about the role of art and music in conveying this history and combating this revisionism or whatever you want to call it, you know, what your own experiences and also the different cultures because, you know, voila, I mean, it's going to be different, you know, where you are. Um, and, you know, Dennis, I mean, Africa is a continent, it's not a country, right? <laughs> and then if you look at, <laughs> you look at each country, you know, Zimbabwe, how many languages, 10, 20, whatever, you know, and it, like, it's everywhere, right? And then you guys in, in Italy, um, you know, there's not one Italy, there's, you know, there's North, South, et cetera, right? <laughs> there's many countries there. But I'd be interested in, in, in your thoughts on, on other ways to convey this history to young people, what we can do. Well, I think before we, we get to that, we're gonna get ready to open it up to the audience, so we'll kind of roll in your question. Okay, well, leave, leave yeah. that as a note for no, the no, no. future. No, I think we're, we're gonna get to it, because I was thinking something similar, um, Professor Palmer, and I was thinking a lot about what you offered to us. Um, Layla, and I really wanna thank you for that, is um, to Dennis, to Walla, um, to Anna and Stefano, who are with us representing youth, is, what are some new models yeah. in getting this history across? Because I don't think we have to limit it to a certain um, modality, right? Um, because what I'm hearing is we're all dealing with something different in our different context, right? And so I think it's like really challenging to have this conversation across all of the different things that we're navigating, where we live or where we work or the histories that we're contending with. And so I really want to have Dennis and Anna and Stefano and Walla have the last word from this panel before we turn it over to the Q&A and giving us some inspiration and hope for what new models exist out there to getting these stories across so that youth can take them up and make the change and not let these things happen again. So um, Dennis, since we, Professor Palmer was initially inspired by your comments, do you wanna go ahead and comment on that? Some new models or things that you've seen work at your site? Yes, uh, for the new models that are working uh, uh, now is what you can, about the means of communication has been so easier and faster uh, than before. Uh, in a way that when someone just gets in the internet, then within a second, the message is already passed to millions of people. So with this, we find uh, so many curious youth who are looking for content. And now the content, then now we have to, they have to turn back to the elders, they turn back uh, to history so that they can get the content because the means of uh, conveying the message is already there with the current situation. So we get now more young people now getting into music, getting into art, as a means through which they can convey the message they have. 
so it is now upon us and everyone else so that uh, in every means we have that we can avail the information to these young people, the better, so that we have the more narratives we have, the clearer the information will be because now we love opportunity of digesting many lines of truth until now we, we synthesize the truth itself. Thanks, Dennis. And Anna and Stefano, do you have any comments on this? So it's hard to, 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 to summarize, but I would say that one thing uh, I want to point out is that we usually find it very inspiring also for us to work with young people because uh, sometimes they are more ready, especially if they are in a setting where they have the space and time to talk among them and uh, maybe to work for one day on a topic, uh, then they are ready to question their own narratives, for example, the ones that they interjected, uh, way more than when we work with adults, for example. So, and, and sometimes they feel this pressure that we put on, on their generation, like you are the new generation, you are the future, therefore, somehow you have to solve problems that were not created by you. And you have to deal with issues that were created by the previous generation. And uh, it's very interesting when they question this narrative, like, hey, but why should we be the one who solves things that you don't want to solve, you know? And they are the future, but they are the present. But we are too. And uh, I think that's powerful because when they call also the previous generation to, to question what they are doing yeah. and why they don't want to face some things, that's something that we appreciate. If I can add something on the art part, uh, we like sometimes to deconstruct uh, music, songs, lyrics, um, meaning to reflect, to critical, critically analyze uh, these, because sometimes maybe the risk is also that we attribute to art this healing power that it can have, but it depends. You know, art can be used also to promote violence. And it's also part of nowadays reality and of young people reality you know you you have artists that send some message and messages and other artists who send violent messages and uh, the more maybe the more it's abstract the more it's easy to interpret as you want just as an example hymn to the joy which i love as a piece of music it's now used as uh, the anthem of the european union which won a Nobel Prize for peace because we didn't vote among EU members in the last 70 years. Uh, but it was very appreciated also by many dictators like Hitler, like uh, Mao, Stalin. It was used as a hymn of Rhodesia, a very racist country. So the point is when it's very abstract, it can be very beautiful and we all feel moved. But then what's the content? And then maybe it's better to discuss, you know, if we say all humanity, do we mean everyone really? Or is someone left out of mankind? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, the, I think it like points back to your point, Benjamin, about like finding those red, lines, like having multiple narratives, having multiple ways of communicating, but making sure that you're conveying the full story, right? So that's, that's right. One song can mean a lot of different things and can be used in really negative contexts and also be a beautiful piece of music. It's, it's both and, um, and it's, it's something that, that young people are more aware of than I think a lot of adults recognize, right? And young people, um, and I think we'll, we'll go to you, Walla, and thinking about some of those models that um, you've seen be successful or ways that you want to engage with sites of conscience and world heritage sites um, moving forward. What do you think? 
yes, I think also, uh, as Denise said, um, due to technology and uh, social media, it's a lot more accessible to reach the youth. And uh, uh, a recent thing that happened in Lebanon in 2019 was uh, an uprising where the younger generation um, protested uh, protested at, in order to know to know uh, the history of Lebanon and uh, because they they are fed up the what we reached in Lebanon the economic crisis we are having here and um, even the those who who were the leaders during the war in Lebanon are actually in the state now which is uh, unfortunate so uh, that's uh, in 2019, that's when the younger generation said, no, we don't want this any, anymore. So uh, they went and protested in order to change things. And uh, this had a great uh, impact uh, on Lebanon. Now that we see how the younger generation is more, uh, wants to know more about its history than before, because they, the, the present that we are living now in Lebanon is due to the past. So they are now more interested to know more about it to shape our future. Thanks for that, Walla. And we're getting some questions from Zoom, from our online audience now. So we're gonna um, turn it over into the Q&A part for the last 15 minutes here. Um, so there's a question from the audience. How do we navigate difficult conversations when people have different connections to the history? when things are so heated. We've heard a little bit of this already in, a, in our panel today. I'm trying to read the, the group up here, my group online. How do we navigate difficult conversations when people have different connections to the history, right? when things are so heated, and I think what I can describe for you in the United States is like, there's, it's incredibly polarizing. And I'm hearing that from everybody here as well. And um, when you're engaging in these conversations and somebody is all in on their narrative and somebody, and, that, and that's like flies in the face of somebody's way of being in the world, how do you, how do you reckon with that? How do you navigate that in real time? Benjamin? Yeah. Well, it's a very tough question and a very important question, I believe. Uh, because I, I think that um, when you're talking about reconciliation and such issues, uh, it's interesting to see that, that our societies, like people went through um, very different experiences and somehow uh, their opinion and their vision about history is very much based on this collective experiences. Mm -hmm. So when you were talking about this individual point of view, I think it's very important, relevant, definitely. But it's important to see how it's backed up, right, by this collective experience. Uh, and, uh, and at the same time, I would say that, at the same time, it's, it's very challenging, because like when you put two people in the same room, they will just throw chairs at each other uh, if they come from different collective experiences. At the same time, it's also an amazing leverage because uh, the worst thing, and we often face that, I think, in Brazil, in, in particular, maybe also in other countries in South America, the worst thing is indifference. Mm -hmm. And when people like just don't care. Uh, when you, get, you can throw anything on the table, people just don't care. Uh, you can talk about dictatorship, you can talk. So when people are polarized, at least they care. And, and I think that that's already something. And that's, that's why I'm saying it's a leverage. And it's about what are the tools we can develop and use to be able and create a safe place for debate, for discussion, etc. And in some of the videos, they were talking about that. And I think that's very challenging. We are testing forms based on nonviolent communication to try and help people to talk to each other and, and to listen to each other mainly before talking to each other. But it's definitely challenging. But I don't want to answer, I just wanted to to pinpoint at the fact that, to, to, to acknowledge the importance of the question, the importance of looking at these very different collective experiences. And uh, 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 David, uh, you were talking also yesterday about uh, uh, the Vietnam War and, and stuff like that. And I don't remember now the reference, but I think uh, some scholars wrote about the, how, 
you were talking about the, the, the Vietnam War. Uh, we were, what, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I don't remember the scholar who wrote about that, but who said that somehow how this collective experience of those who went to the war and those who protested against the war created a kind of, of, of separation that's so difficult to, to kind of, of reach out. So yeah, I think these are very interesting points, but I, I do think that at least the fact that they're caring and they want to fight over something right. is, can, is a Can I pick up on that? <laughs> yeah, it was just Because um, what was really <laughs> interesting with the Vietnam War is that uh, there were those of us who were university students who were protesters, you know, the sit-ins, all that. And um, nonviolent, I, I was in the nonviolent part. And um, one of the students that was in my dorm was a guy by the name of Rich Kovac, and he came from a working class family, Polish ancestry, and uh, he was really into weightlifting, and he was a law student, and the only thing in his dorm room was about four books, and they were all law books. And th that's what he did. He was totally disciplined in terms of study. He was an ex-Marine, had been in Vietnam. And I remember walking across the campus with him. And he said, look, you know, I'm not going to say much, but the protests that you're involved in, you're doing the right thing. He says, I don't go public with this, but the stuff I saw in Vietnam, you know, guys collecting ears and all this, you don't even want to know about it. And I think what happened was that, um, it's like when you reach out to somebody with a different experience, but they've had that lived experience, or you know, like you, like your experience in in, Ch in Chile, you know, like you it's you it's burnt into you, right? And so if we the connecting point can often be experience. You're not going to convince people by arguing and words and that and the other, but if 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 you draw on a common experience where that brings you together, and young people can really do that, I think that's where we create that, that connection. That's, that's where we can start that conversation. May I share an experience oh. in uh, the way you can fail doing those things? Okay, we prepare uh, a workshop with students, and uh, I, I was in that moment in an uh, ex-concentration camp, Villa Grimaldi in Santiago de Chile, and uh, so we prepare, three groups with uh, psycholo one psychologist, pedagogy, okay. And we thought, okay, we are going to make a guiding tour with the students and we are going to talk about the history of what happened here in Villa Grimaldi, which was a, a torture secret center. And uh, we are going to, to talk about young people who disappear here. And we have some pictures dressed in the same uniform as the students, so to create this, this empathy, you know, and to, so everything was perfect. And then we are going to work in groups and uh, we are going to prepare material. The material was, uh, we collecting some information from the papers about bullying. You know, so we say, okay, this is perfect, you know, perfect, because after this guiding tour, after this empathy, after they know what the violence can do with young people like them, so we are done. And so uh, each group read a story that we created, but based on, on, on real things that, for example, Pablito had uh, uh, this thing so to hear music, and then came uh, Pedro and took out the things, you know, and he was a really uh, uh, violent guy. That was mainly the story, you know, so we thought, okay, they are going to make the connection about, you know, the, 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 the violence, and, and the whole group say, oh, we agree, and they emphasize with the perpetrator. Wow. I said, they were absolutely em uh, empathic with, um, with the history. But when we talk about the problem they had in their schools in that moment, and so our, our pedagogic there were desperate, you know, and they looked at me and said, what can I say? You know, and uh, so we, I asked them, why are you, do you think that it's okay that Pedro took the thing from Pablo? That was. And they say, because Pablo is stupid. You know, so they had a, you know, so it's not that easy to, <laughs> to, to deal with that. 
I, I remember that the, the, the pedagogic and, and uh, the psychology, the, the psychology was a cousin of mine. They were sweeping, you know, with this bunch of children seeing that. And it was a very difficult task to make them reflect yeah. that it was, you know, what happened with the guy that is vulnerable, you know, he needs to be friendly, be friendly with him, solve the problem in a different way. You want to listen to music, ask him, you know, and you can do it together, you know, but uh, it was so sometimes what we think uh, as a good experience yeah. can be a complete <laughs> disaster, but, you know. And that's a, that's, that's really a really powerful story and I think a great example of why, and, and this isn't one of the comments that I'll share at the, at the very end of the session, but we have to involve youth. Like if youth have been, been involved in maybe the design, like maybe some of that could have come up, right, before you went out there and, and took that program for a walk. So I think that really speaks to the goal of this session, that we have to get youth engaged on the ground level and that's what Dennis and Anna and Stefano and Walla, you know, are doing at their sites. And, um, we're going to turn it over to the in-person audience to see if there's any questions for the panel. In-person in folk. <laughs> Is there any questions from the in-person? All right, we got two, we got three. Hi, my name is Diana Naom. I'm with the uh, International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Um, this is a question for Wala in the Middle East and North Africa context at large. I'm curious if there are uh, general trends that you've noticed um, in the region among youth that are initiating these memory-related projects, or um, if they are more context-specific uh, or country specific, is there a regional wide, um, uh, is there a level of engagement, support, communication, mobilization among these youth groups um, that also contribute to increased awareness raising? Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in like transnational trends uh, that perhaps Wala has noticed across different youth groups in the region. Hello, Diana. Uh, yes, I, uh, we noticed that the youth were very cooperative and uh, they are really, um, they, they're fed up with what they listen to uh, from uh, the older generation about their history in Lebanon. So uh, that's why they are more into researching themselves what uh, what happened by listening to each other. So when we did this, um, this round table with them, um, they listened to each other, they showed the uh, interest, they listened to others' perspectives. Not everyone had the same perspective of things. And I think that's okay. No one, no one should have the same opinion on the same thing. I mean, it's okay if uh, we all have different perspectives and uh, I think this is uh, this is the only way that we can write history. We can't write history based on one narrative. That's impossible. So I think by joining different narratives, embracing different narratives, that's how, uh, as youth, uh, we can be able to um, finally uh, write history and counter the revisionism done by the political leaders in the country um, by telling only their own heroic histories about the war and not listening to the victim-centered ones. Um, thank you and hello everyone. My name is Sarah Case and I'm with Sites of Conscience. Um, I think we've heard from a number of the panelists about the power of personal stories and first-person testimonies in engaging youth uh, in history, but I'm curious if you could all share, or any of you who have examples, share examples of ways to provide that sort of broader historical framework um, in relation to the personal stories, 
especially maybe in contexts where there isn't uh, the availability or access to primary source documents. I don't know if I get exactly your question, but uh, um, I, I want to talk about that oral history, you know, and, and my personal uh, experience. Uh, at the beginning, after the dictatorship, uh, we were testimony. We, we, we give testimony. We have to go to the court. We have to uh, adapt our uh, testimony. And it was a very good testimony when you were very exact. Uh, I was detained then. And then I saw this and that, and it was perfect testimony if you can identify the, the perpetrator. And everything ends when uh, you went out of that uh, prison. So there was a, a kind of uh, uh, model pattern to provide testimonies. You did not exist before that. The judge is he does, he's not interested in what happened in your childhood, what you were engaged in the social movement, what happened with your grandparents, etc. No. So we have that special pattern, and then um, we learned because former experiences uh, of the other centers of the other parts uh, that. Uh, the testimony is, has to start with your personal uh, and broader you know, history. To, uh, and that is the power, I think, is of the um, testimony we have now. You know, because we talk about our childhood, but and it's quite important because everybody plays with balls in the street. You know, so you, you, you can, you can uh, touch the others, and maybe you can touch the others 30 years later, you know, so, um, and uh, to explain from your point of view, for your own experience, what happened in the country, what happened in the, in, in the continent, why you were involved in somehow, because there was a war in Vietnam, because I started doing that, in my political activity started in, in a, in a, money in a demo against the, the Vietnam War. You know, Vietnam War, we didn't know where it was Vietnam, <laughs> you see? But uh, so I think that is the powerful things of the oral archives, thinking in that way, no, not in the pattern and the model that uh, uh, you, you do in, in the court. I, I don't know if I get you, but uh, it's quite important that can, can I just briefly respond to that? Uh, it's a really good point. And um, I want to come back to Dennis's uh, point again, uh, content. A lot of young people, when they, when they want to find something online and they want to find an answer, you get content. And one of the best ways to get content, I'm sorry to say this, you got to read a book, OK? Vietnam, we had to read the history of Vietnam. Uh, you know, my favorite book is uh, War Comes to Long On, which was how the Vietnamese organized resistance against the, you know, the, the corrupt government in the U.S. But uh, I think the same thing with Ukraine. You know, a lot of, we have these debates about U Ukraine. Well, read the history of Ukraine, uh, Polky's book. Uh, you know, you want to know about Russia. Well, read about the history of Russia, the Soviet Union, how it changed, how it fell apart, the rise of Putin, all this. You've got to read, okay? You've got to read books. And it's, it's hard for a lot of young people because you're so wrapped up in social media that you can't concentrate for longer than five minutes. I had this problem with my own son. And so what we decided to do was we actually sit down and uh, we read together out loud. We're reading Kerouac's uh, On the Road, which is a really cool book, okay? And uh, he works hospitality, cocktails, whatever, you know, uh, gets by. And um, you read together. Okay, and you can only go to social media for so long, but then you gotta actually read. And you gotta read good things. And the thing is, you can get a lot of this stuff online, you get it from libraries, whatever. But um, it's called study, you gotta do it, you know? And once you get into it, once you get into it, um, it opens doors, you know? Okay, we're gonna take one more question. And I think that every, just to respond to you quickly, Professor Palmer, everybody has a different 
way of learning. And I think that, you know, one of the comments that we got on Zoom is that sites of memory are seen as gatekeepers of knowledge and information also, right? And that if we don't have, not necessarily even like reading books, but if we don't go to places where youth are, the youth are going to get left out of the conversation. So reading may not work for everybody. It's really great to hear that it, it worked for your family, but there are other way, there are different, lots of different learning styles out there. But I hear you. I hear you for sure. We're going to take one more question. Hi, so I'm Ariel. I'm also from the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. So my question is, you guys spoke a lot about the red line, and I can't help but wonder in when it comes to history and like all the multiple perspectives and oral history regarding that, like how do you define what the red line is and who actually decides that? Oh man, that's like a whole session. <laughs> that's the next session, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think, does anybody have a, a thought? A, que a question could be a good response to that too. No, I, 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 I would just, since I, I, I use these words, I mean, I think, as I said, I wasn't really uh, trying to answer. I was really trying to 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 pinpoint at, at the problem. So I really think I, I'm I, I'm not going to dodge what you're saying because I agree with what you're saying, and it's all about it's all about that. But uh, so it, it would really ask uh, a longer debate. I hope maybe we can answer on the next session to these questions. But because it, it's also coll collectively uh, defined this red line, obviously, and and you cannot consider it. It's not. Uh, there's no power structure that also tries to define it. Uh, uh, so it's, it's challenging. Uh, but I, I do believe that uh, uh, um, within a given political context, within a given educational context as well, uh, within a context also of a set of values, uh, uh, how to respect other people's voices, etc., you can, you can really try and, and define it together. But I think it has to be seen as a result, not not that the red line is ne it's not it's not a starting point, but it's a result that also afterwards brings you to other, uh, let's say, uh, um, to the creation of a kind of safe place where you can have more controversial debates. But there there has to be to start with an agreement yep. about this red line. But it's a collective construction. I mean, it doesn't fall from the sky for sure. So it's it's a, I mean I'm not answering. No, and I think, and, and uh, I, I, well, um, Benjamin, so this is a challenge. For me, it's not a challenge, it's a battle, you know, it's a struggle. And uh, because, for example, in Chile, there is a, a right-wing government, so they do not speak about dictatorship, they speak about military regime with these consequences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the, there's a battle. You know, my red line or my line or my truth is, for example, that there was a coup. Militaries in Chile bombed the, the, the place where the president was. So the right wing is discussing, oh, he committed suicide. Who cares about it? Think, they bomb, you know, with the president there. That is the fact. That's the way it started. And then there were torture, there were killing, there were missing people, and all of that was part of a plan of the state. They used the state and public uh, resources to kill Chilean people, women, children, young people, and a lot of uh, people from other countries too. So what is this real life for me? No, this is no real life, that is the truth. And I'm and I'm fighting for that truth, and those things happen in specific sites. So I'm fighting for recovering those sites. For that reason, I participated in recovering Villa Grimaldi, in recovering Londres 38, in recovering Estadio Nacional, in recovering, you know, another place in this school, I, I don't like the name, and now I'm, you know, trying to recover uh, Colonia Dignidad, you know, because recovering the places, is going to, uh, to, to put maybe the red line, I don't know, but to establish that the crimes against humanity were there, and they had to be punished. For a long time we were saying, okay, we uh, talk about peace and ni vida, no more. And we were very, you know, we felt that we were very good people saying, 
not again. It's not going to, to, to pass that again that the state is going to call people. And in Chile, it happens again. It happens again, and, and two years ago, we have 17 young people without one eye because the cops shot their faces, you know? So this knee beat out, and what is my rail line? Never forgive and never forget. Don't think that the rights are forever. That is one red line for me. Rights are not there forever. Look at what happened here in the United States with the, with the last decision of the Supreme Court. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, but I think it's, I mean, this is, I think, the question that we need to lift up into the final session. And so I would just challenge everybody um, who's going to come into that session to be thinking about this, because I think that this is a real struggle in a lot of the conversation. And I think in a lot of the work that Sites of Conscience are doing right now around the world, and so I want to thank all of our panelists that have joined us in person and joined us online. So let's give it up for everybody. And um, I want to say thank you to the folks that, that called in from uh, different time zones and different parts of the world. And folks who are here in the audience, um, I've been asked to make an announcement that there's more food in the back. And we'll take a break and be back here at 3 o'clock for our last section. Session. for the in-person, right? Just for the in-person, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to get your own dessert if you're online. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, and now we'll uh, move into our kind of final session of a really great day filled with all kinds of conversation in person and online. So our last session is really hearing from um, Sites of Conscious members uh, who you've already met in the previous session about what they actually do at their sites. Sites of Conscience are places of memory that bring people together. And we've talked a lot about the challenge of that. From museums, historic sites, different kinds of memory initiatives, they act as spaces where members can share stories, honor those of others, and explore how past events relate to contemporary struggles. It's by preserving these often painful memories that we can foster a sense of empathy that can ensure that human rights atrocities do not occur again. It's that red line um, that we were talking about earlier. But now, even more challenging, the rise of extremist ideologies, coupled with the challenges of new media and communication technologies, have resulted in these kind of reinterpretations and a kind of denialism by uh, somebody that somebody brought up that threaten the memories that we strive to preserve. So what role do our sites of conscience around the world and other cultural and heritage sites have in countering this trend of revisionism and denialism? We first, and this is a core tenant of the work of sites of conscience, need to foster dialogue between different community groups with special attention to those not represented in our current narratives. I remember when I came to the coalition, one of the first activities of a site of conscience member I heard about was actually Perm 36 in Siberia, um, a gulag, a prison camp that brought uh, former guards and former prisoners together in dialogue. And it just seemed kind of surprising and incredible. Um, so we need to foster dialogue. We need to include those narratives who've been excluded. We need to provide everyone an opportunity to own a part of the collective memory. But we also really need to, it has been our focus today, place the young generations at the center of the debate and solicit their engagement. Uh, no longer can we believe that students and young people are empty vessels to pour in information. We need to really engage with them. The memories that we've worked so hard to preserve can only be maintained by future generations. In this session, we have with us four sites from three continents that'll provide us with case studies related to the interpretation of World War II histories, highlighting their role in fostering youth engagement and critical thinking among new generations about historic narratives promoting justice and advancing human rights. They come from different countries and backgrounds and face somewhat different challenges. The four sites have the same objectives when it comes to countering revisionism and denialism and engaging new generations in memory, truth, and justice around World War II heritage. So I'm really excited to have them all join us to share their experiences, strategies, and strengths. 
So we're gonna begin, and I will say again, I've asked these panelists to share the sites of conscience or places that could be sites of conscience that are really meaningful to them. Uh, so Rose Masters, a park ranger and oral history specialist at the Monsonar National Historic Site, will be our first speaker. And when I asked her what sites were interesting to her, she chose two sites in New York State, one not very far from here at all, I don't think, um, the Stonewall National Historic Monument is at the site of the Stonewall Inn, which is the place where uh, LBT, LGBTQ rights in America really began. Um, and she also chose the Women's Rights National Historic Park in upstate New York and Seneca Falls as two places that really exemplify um, the past and the very present nature of the struggles and challenges that are facing us here in America. So Rose, I'm gonna let you go first and share the work of Manzanar. Thank you, Linda, and thank you to everyone for being so welcoming at this seminar. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, as Linda mentioned, I work at Manzanar National Historic Site. I lead our site's oral history program. A little bit about Manzanar's background. On February 19th, on February 19th of 1942, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 which within just a few months led to the unconstitutional and racially motivated forced eviction and incarceration of Japanese Americans living on the west coast of the United States. Bo Sakaguchi in high school in Southern California recalled a teacher questioning his loyalty on the day that he had to check out of school for the last time. He said, I started to cry. I didn't have the proper words to tell her that we knew nothing about Japan. Why would we have any loyalty to Japan? We were born in this country, and my parents knew they would stay in this country. Yoshie Okimoto Hayashi remembered, all of a sudden, my parents say, we've got to get out of here. I said, what for? Where are we going? It was a shock. We boarded a Greyhound bus and came directly to Manzanar. That was really a disaster for us. And being stuck in with so many strangers, to me, it was the worst part. 15-year-old Sumiko Yamauchi recalled, we only had one suitcase, and it was just a cardboard box, you know, nothing fancy, and you couldn't get too much into it. And that's what we took, just the clothes we had. When we got there, the barrack wasn't finished yet, and the dust was coming in. The floor had openings, and the wind was blowing through there, and it was whistling all night. You had the searchlights going back and forth through the window, and you had to hear the jeeps going up and back. I thought to myself, oh gosh, what are we into? I think that was the most scary thing that first night. When we got up, our blanket on top was just thick with dust. We thought nothing could get worse than this. John Tateshi, who was a young child when incarcerated, described one of the earliest memories of his entire life. My mother was taking me around the back end of Manzanar. I remember being really confused. And then we got toward the fence, and there was a guard tower there. And my mother knelt down next to me and said, don't ever try to go outside the fence. It's very dangerous, so you have to stay away from the fence. And as she was telling me this, I was looking up at this guard, and he had a rifle. And I understood, you know, rifles are dangerous. And I was old enough to know when a soldier has a rifle, he uses it for one thing. It wasn't so much what she was saying as the fear I sensed in her voice. And I realized that you try to escape and the consequences were pretty serious. I just assume you'd die 
You go outside the fence, you die. I think I was really kind of traumatized by what my mother was saying to me. And so I had this real fear of those fences around us. These stories are among more than 650 oral histories, along with extensive primary documents, artifacts, photographs, and archaeological records preserved and shared by the National Park Service at Manzanar. All of these can be powerful tools in countering revisionist claims, not only through sharing historical truth, but by providing the opportunity for human-to-human -human connections across time and space, sometimes revealing unexpected emotional truths. Manzanar National Historic Site was established on March 3rd, 1992, not by a government reflecting on its past wrongs, but as a result of decades of grassroots efforts by those who had been wronged, along with their children and community. Inspired and influenced by the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, the first Manzanar pilgrimage in December 1969, which is shown here, was not just a key event in remembrance of the incarceration, but in many ways served, served as a catalyst for the eventual preservation of Japanese American confinement sites and for the campaign for redress and reparations for survivors of the camps. Following this pilgrimage, Su Kunitomi Embry, who was incarcerated in Manzanar, and Warren Furutani, whose parents were incarcerated in Arkansas, chaired a new organization called the Manzanar Committee. Committee members were active in getting Manzanar designated as a California State Historic Landmark in 1973 and in the successful redress movement of the 1970s and 80s, which culminated in a presidential apology and $20,000 to each survivor of the camps who was still living. This image to the left illustrates early awareness of the power of first-person testimony in swaying public opinion toward change. Here, longtime Manzanar committee member Tak Yamamoto, who is already fed up with revisionists, um, is encouraging Japanese-American World War II veterans and other former incarcerees to testify at the congressionally authorized hearings in 1981. To the right is the 1973 California State Landmark plaque, which is still featured prominently at Manzanar. You should be able to note from uh, the size here the bullet holes in it, the hatchet marks, and the first C in concentration camp chiseled off. Eventually, through the unwavering perseverance of the Manzanar Committee and others, Manzanar would be recognized as a National Historic Landmark in 1985 and a National Historic Site in 1992, which required a bipartisan act of Congress. Perhaps the loudest revisionist in Manzanar's history was Lillian Baker, founder of the ironically named Americans for Historical Accuracy. She didn't think it was ironic. Baker and her devotees objected to the wording of the 1973 plaque, publishing articles, books, letters, anything really, decrying this kind of remembrance of Japanese American history. Sue Kunitomi Embry recalled encountering Baker during the first planning meeting for the 1973 plaque. Sue said, the commission recessed and we pushed forward to talk to them individually. As I passed Ms. Baker, she deliberately elbowed me in the ribs. My initial reaction was shock, and then I thought, I'd better get away from her. That was my introduction to Ms. Baker. Baker spoke at the redress hearings as well, sharing her displeasure in a lengthy 14-page testimony in which she refers to the Japanese-American incarceration as, quote, the big lie. Here, she's pictured uh, attempting to tear World War II veteran Jim Kawaminami's written testimony from his hands. Um, security intervened on his behalf. During Manzanar National Historic Site's establishment and early years as a national park site, Baker's books and seemingly constant presence in newspapers influenced people from all corners of the country. 
but especially in the local communities surrounding Man Manzanar, who latched on to her form of revisionism. In angry letters, phone calls, speeches, um, at planning meetings, events, even in threats to the families of contractors hired by the National Park Service, the Baker cohort voiced its opposition by claiming Manzanar had no guard towers, had no five-strand barbed wire fence. Military police were housed 10 miles to the south. Japanese Americans were never forced to leave their homes, instead voluntarily coming to Manzanar and living behind barbed wire, a place which they could freely leave at any time. So how do we successfully counter this and other waves of revisionist invention? I don't have an easy answer to this. I have a couple of thoughts and ob observations. The first is that in the two decades since I first started working at Manzanar, I've witnessed people who had been in Baker's camp become dedicated supporters of the site. How? By inviting them to be involved, creating connection between them and young people, especially working and volunteering at Manzanar, encouraging them to participate in Manzanar's public archaeology digs, Introducing them to docents who spent World War II incarcerated in Manzanar and encouraging conversation. Helping them encounter the power of first-person truth. This won't work for everyone, but for every loud revisionist, there are infinite numbers of people who haven't even formed opinions on this history and who likely don't even know about it. Do work to reach out to these people and make human connection part of this work. And for those of us doing this work with the public, learn this history well. We've heard this a lot today. Know the, know the truth, know the facts. Research, listen, be curious, be humble. As a teacher, remain also a student. Perseverance. If I've learned anything from people like Sue Kunitomi Embry, this is it. Be perse persevere in telling the truth. Primary voices in order to nurture space for human connection. Prioritize these. Record, preserve, and learn from oral histories. Share these stories through video, audio, reading, like I did at the beginning, or if possible, in person. This is Pat Sakamoto during a youth engagement program, pointing to herself as a little girl in her mother's arms, leaving Manzanar in 1945. Her mom couldn't talk about her incarceration story. It was too painful but she asked Pat to share it when she was gone. One of our visitor center themes is one camp, 10,000 lives, one camp, 10,000 stories. As proven in the campaign for redress, first person testimony has the power to make change and we never know whose story might impact somebody. This note was left in our, oops, excuse me. This note on the right was left in our site comment book. It says, October 30th, 2015. I have been prejudiced all my life against Japanese. 75 years. As of today, that is gone. I cry as I write this. Let's prioritize the continued involvement of stakeholder communities and elevate partnerships with them. These communities are the reason why this site is protected. We're privileged to be sharing their stories. And especially, teach young people. Listen to young people. Connect them with elders directly or through oral history. Inspire, inspire them to continue learning and to teach others. I want to finish by speaking a little bit about this project, Qatari, which touches on many of the ideas above. It's an intense educational weekend planned in partnership between park staff at Manzanar and the Manzanar Committee, who's been involved since the beginning. For two long days, these students are immersed in a place-based historical dive into Manzanar's history, with emphasis on connecting students with real people who were incarcerated in the camps, along with indigenous elders and activists. This is Yoshie Okimoto Hayashi on the far right, whose recollection I read at the beginning, and Min Tonai speaking with the students of Katari. Students also watch and listen to oral histories, read them aloud, and learn with primary documents and photographs. 
They carry forward what they've learned into Day of Remembrance programs at their universities and in running the popular Manzanar at Dusk program, an intergenerational conversation that follows the annual Manzanar pilgrimage. Some have direct ties to the incarceration. Others are learning it for the first time. All of them are the future of these stories. Engaging younger generations in these powerful personal accounts of World War II incarceration may be one of the vital ways in which the authors of this 1973 plaque envisioned this phrase etched in steel, not as a passive hope, but as a continuing call to action. May the injustices and humiliation suffered here as a result of hysteria, racism, and economic exploitation never emerge again. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rose, that was terrific. Um, I think there's a couple takeaways for me. Sadly, that revisionists have always been with us <laughs> is one. But the sense about dedicated citizen action is so compelling in the story of Manzanar. Our next speakers are our virtual ones <laughs> that I hope are going to appear on screen. <laughs> OK. And are they there? OK. Do I go to the next slide? Yes, we yes. are. <laughs> ah, thanks. So we're really pleased to have Elena Bergonzoni and Stefano Merzi from the Peace School of Montesole. When I asked them about sites of conscience that really mattered to them, uh, they each had an answer. Elena mentioned Fond B92 in Serbia because of the bravery and passion of the work they're doing under very difficult circumstances. Stefano mentioned, I'm going to do my best to pronounce it right, Stefano. Um, Guernica Gogorat, am I close? Um, in Spain, as a place that really builds on an idea of peace and a place he feels a personal connection to. So we're really pleased to have the two of them tell us about the Monte Pizzoli Peace School's work. Okay, there you go. Well, thank you, Linda. Um, we would like also to thank the organizer for the opportunity. Um, before we start, I just need to mention that since we are in a natural park, a little bird uh, a couple of hours ago entered this room. So if you see us like with the eyes like this, it's because the bird is flying inside the room. Okay, with that being said, let's start with our presentation. Okay, the title, he also did good things. There are uh, several sentences in the populistic uh, revisionist discourse in Italy where we have this subject, he, or sometimes it's him, and he and him always refer to Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictatorship um, in the period of uh, World War II in Italy. Um, Without even saying his name, everybody in Italy would know the sentences about him. And uh, in this presentation, we will try to explain why in Italy, in this uh, specific moment, revisionism is not something dealing with uh, like extremists, but also politically moderate people uh, can share revisionist uh, uh, narr narratives. Yeah, this is us, okay. <laughs> the project, uh, the Peace School started in 1990s. So that's the time where the Balkan War uh, was on and uh, the pacifist associations and movements were very strong at that time in Italy. Um, the project was started by the civil society, different associations, and it started not as a memory site, uh, which developed an educational program, 
but as an educational institution on a memory site with the idea that the memory site would have an added value to the educational activity. It was then uh, established as a foundation in 2002. And now our activities are with uh, human beings in general from a very young age sometimes to adults, school groups, individuals, even residential camps with teenagers and adults. And we always work uh, with methods uh, um, which are informal, experiential, sometimes creative or uh, playful as well. And we generally work in very small groups so that uh, everybody in the group will have the space and time to express him or herself. And just to be sure, do you see the presentation? Yeah. Okay. So now you should see a beautiful field with yellow flowers. And uh, this is Motosole, as you can see it nowadays. So it's a very beautiful place, but it's a place where a tragic uh, event happened. During the Second World War uh, in 1944, in one week of military operation, uh, Nazi fascist troops killed around 800 uh, people that were uh, most of all civilians, uh, meaning uh, they were all women, children and elder people, apart from a small group, maybe 10, 12 partisans, so anti-fascist anti combatants. And it's considered the biggest uh, massacre of civilians that happened in Italy during the Second World War. Uh, some historians also say maybe in the uh, Western Europe. Uh, usually Nazi troops were doing this in, in the Eastern Front, but uh, less often it was common to act this way uh, in Italy or France. Um, it was a strategic place because it was very close to the front line. And uh, the result of this operation was the total destruction of more than 100 villages, houses and places. And uh, the area was abandoned. So. For 30 years, absolutely no one lived here. And even nowadays, there are very few people living in this area. And that's why today it's a historical, but also a natural park. Because uh, after centuries in which it was populated, then uh, human life never came back here. Well, when we come to uh, the issue of revisionism in Italy, as far as concerns the um, period of World War II and the fascist regime, we need to take into consideration that um, after the war, there was a sort of need to heal traumas and also to politically remove the possibility of uh, fascism to be back again. So the anti-fascist narrative uh, was given a lot of space uh, and uh, it was really like enhanced the role of anti-fascist combatants uh, with a sort of result and then there was a sort of uh, institutional memory in Italy defining Italy as a victim of World War II. Um, and the removal of fascism was not only political, it was cultural, it was historical as well. So the fact that uh, it's not possible even nowadays to deal with uh, uh, fascism in historical terms um, left the space for um, revisionist narratives because um, there was the, a real truth acknowledgement um, process. Yeah, very quickly also, we would like to mention that the constant comparison with uh, the crimes committed by Nazism uh, played a role in this as well. And also uh, already during the war, uh, two myths, two stereotypes actually uh, started to be built and then they are still active nowadays. So somehow the idea that um, there is a good Italian, Italians were, and the vast majority, good people who were not effective as uh, fighters because they liked life too much to be effective and cruel. And therefore there is no mention of Italian war crimes, fascist war crimes. 
And uh, on the other hand, uh, there is the, the this stereotype of, and the Germans were really committed to the regime and very, and of course it's a fact and it's true that in Italy there were, uh, there was a movement of resistance that Mussolini was killed by anti Italian anti-fascists. But let's say that this narrative, like, yeah, the Germans really believed in the system, the Italians didn't, doesn't help to deal with the fascist uh, crimes and the fascist past and the fact that actually fascism lasted way longer than Nazism. I mean, when the war started, we were on a dictatorship for 20 years. And uh, as Elena already mentioned, uh, the point is also that we had a real amnesty after the proclamation of the Republic of Italy, very few days after, so in, uh, in June 46, um, uh, there was the decision by the Constitutional Assembly to approve a general amnesty who meant there were no trials for the fascists who committed crimes during the war and before the war. We are talking also about colonial crimes, for example. Of fascist Italy. And the lack of a clear truth uh, acknowledgement uh, meant that, uh, of course, revisionism was very possible and easy. When we come to colonialism, there's also, I mean, we can't probably even define it revisionism because there's no other narrative in Italy uh, other than the fascist one. I mean, not even a narrative, memorials. Um, um, the way the colonial past of Italy is remembered is through uh, the eyes, the lens of the fascist regime. For instance, here in this slide, you have on the left a memorial dedicated to an Italian commander in East Africa. Uh, it was also active in Libya before going to North Africa. And it's, um, it's in the central square in Modena. Um, that's quite interesting. Also, the screenshot uh, you have on the right. That's an exercise uh, I did with uh, some groups here. I asked them to Google the word Ambaradan, which is a, uh, a word that in Italian means something chaotic. But actually, it comes from history. And again, it comes from colonial history. Ambaradan is a mountain in Ethiopia, where in 1936, uh, there was uh, a battle which actually resulted in a huge war crime. Also, toxic, toxic gas were um, used by the Italian army. But as you can see, the word Ambaradan is now used as a regular word. So here we have a short list of places with this name, a cafeteria or a theater for teenagers or a gelateria, an ice cream parlor, always bearing the name of this massacre. And here uh, you can see in the, this is basically a screenshot of uh, an online newspaper, which is also printed actually. It's called Il Tempo. And um, it refers, the article is uh, concerns a mausoleum of Graziani. Who is Graziani? Graziani is, uh, was a general of the fascist army. He was uh, one of the governors of several Italian colonies. And he was a war criminal, despite the fact that he was never uh, on a trial for what he did. He had trials for being a Nazi collaborator in the last part of the war. He was also one of the few generals who stayed loyal to Mussolini also after the armistice of Italy, but not for uh, the, 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 the crimes he did, for example, in Ethiopia, where he authorized and, and used and promoted the use of gas also on civilians there. And uh, in 2012, so very recently, this mausoleum dedicated to him was built fascist also in the choice of the structure, the wording, there is written a homeland uh, on it. And, um, but the title of the article, speaking about revisionism, is that the revisionists now want to tear down this mausoleum. 
And the mayor is very upset about this revisionism. So I thought it was interesting for this audience because basically they are saying that those who question this were heroes, let's say. Uh, and we know they are criminals, but that's not public domain apparently. And uh, under the picture, there are also references to the George Floyd case. And uh, here you have another very recent example. Here you can you have the a translation of an uh, extremely recent law that was approved this May uh, by the Parliament. And um, if you look the, at the aims of this law, the point would be to uh, it, it speaks about values, ethics connected with civil participation, solidarity, volunteering which according to the parliament are embodied by these uh, troops, part of the Italian army, uh, the Alpine troops that were existing already back in the days in the first and the second world war. And it, but the day they chose is the 26th of January, which is the day uh, of a uh, battle in the second world war where the Alpine troops were part of the Axis forces invading U uh, the United Soviet Union. So, uh, I, I guess you can see where the problem is without me adding more. Um, so in our education practice, uh, what we do to counter revisionism uh, involves two different things. One is promoting that feeling of proximity through individual stories from the past and being on the memorial site. Um, this would lead to involvement and engagement when they feel that kind of proximity. The other part is promoting a process of truth acknowledges, uh, acknowledgement of uh, crimes committed by the fascist regime, both inside Italy and abroad. Because even for the crimes, the fascist crimes in Italy, there was not uh, uh, a process of uh, truth. So one, um, one workshop we do uh, often with groups uh, is to analyze propaganda from that period in order to deconstruct it. And to also we use it as a source to get to know events that otherwise people might not know. So here you have several examples of colonial propaganda from the fascist period. And uh, the first in the second row, let's say the third image, it says weapons, the most proper weapon. And basically it refers to the use of gas. So it's a way through which analyzing this, we can talk about the, with, with, our, with the, our participants uh, about the use of these kind of weapons during the, the invasion of Ethiopia. And, uh, and also why the fascists were using irony, as in this case, as a mechanism, because it makes it less uh, harsh to accept. Well, also the use of memes is something we take very seriously into consideration because already fascist and Nazi propaganda uh, very often were using uh, postcards or collectible cards uh, um, sometimes very, also very good looking postcards with nice drawings on it in order to convey uh, certain messages. Memes uh, act a little bit the same way, way. I mean, they seem something, they look like something harmless in a way. Uh, they are humoristic, but they act in the end as Trojan horses in order to convey uh, revisionist propaganda. So what we have here for instance, is a picture of Mussolini stating, I never use palm oil, always castor oil. Um, fascist squads uh, were looking for uh, political opposers that were uh, going and chase them in public places like uh, bars and so on. And the where uh, political opposers were then forced to drink a bottle of castor oil. So it was like a violent public humiliation. 
Yeah, we have some example of revisionist discourse and also how do we try to tackle them. So for instance, so a very common sentence during our workshop is fascism was not like Nazism, like fascism wasn't that bad in the end. So the question is, do they differ in terms of violence and dictatorship? Um, in order to get the real things in a way. The second one, we did also good things. Like, for instance, Mussolini. And then another an, an example to tap on the sentence is was dictatorship really needed to do um, very often we first uh, look for reactions in the group. So if the reaction comes from inside the group, it's always better because it's a peer-to-peer -peer, um, discussion. Another very common sentence is about the, the history of Montessori. If Nazi won the war, you would tell the story differently. differently. So I very often ask this question. Okay, but if the Nazi won the war, would you be here? Um, I, don't, I don't mean this sentence to be provocative. It's a true and honest sentence. Because when we start, you know, imagining things, we also should imagine the consequences. Recently in a group, people decided that no, if Nazi won the war, they wouldn't have been there. In a way, what I try to uh, raise is the question that uh, our ancestors survived Second World War. And in a way, this makes us also some, somehow survivors of the Second World War. And we have a legacy, therefore. So another example is that sometimes people um, say, yeah, but okay, also some of the Allied troops or Stalin or they also committed crimes as to equal all the parts in the conflict. And then we ask them, like, does it make things even and why? And um, coupled with the previous uh, way to counteract, usually it works in, in showing also that maybe the reasons why a person says this uh, might hide a, a, an attempt to justify, basically. And another very common sentence is, uh, that we can hear is that, oh, but in Italy, all the anti-fascist combatants were communist. And uh, we use basically very often the story of Montesola. Here, there was a brigade of uh, hundreds of partisans and uh, they all had different ideas. There were uh, monarchic, there were uh, liberals, uh, uh, socialists, communists, Catholics, and people who didn't have a specific political belonging. And here we have uh, Casaglia Cemetery. It's one of the more than 100 sites where the massacre occurred in Montessori area. And outside the cemetery, there, there is this inscription uh, whose last lines say, our compassion for them should mean that all men and women know how to be vigilant so that Nazi fascism will never rise again. Which means um, compassion for victims is not enough. We all need to act so that Nazi fascism will never be back. And thank Perfect. you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you both. So oh, now they're gone. It's like, uh, uh, thank Elena and Stefano so much for, uh, I think what's kind of late at night at home. Um, again, a couple really interesting takeaways here. Um, one, the presence of and the aspects of colonialism as um, connected to all of this, I think are a really interesting conversation. 
And I, I think they're examples that demonstrate the ways in which um, Montessori uses informal experiential learning and conversation and dialogue to really dive into these questions are really kind of wonderful examples. So our next speaker is Lelia Perez Valdez from the Association for Memory and Human Rights Colonia Dignidad in Chile. Oh. Well, now you okay. see it full screen. <laughs> uh, we're up, our apologies. Um, when I asked Lelia about a site that she thought about, she had such an interesting one, which is the homelands of the Mapuche people who were sent away, removed from their homeland, but have fought hard for it to return. And I think there's actually that process of thinking about a homeland. I feel like so much sites of conscience work and to be honest, world heritage work is framed around a physical building. And I think we, as we deepen our understanding about the world and alternative worldviews, understanding that these homelands, these places, the trees, the landscape, are have real meaning in and of themselves for communities, I thought was such a great example of a site of conscience, possible site of conscience. So I'm gonna give the screen to you. This is, this is the magic thing? Okay. That picture was taken from me, my daughter. It's beautiful, right? <laughs> uh, okay, I see. Good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lelia Perez, and uh, I belong to the Association for Memory and Human Rights, Colonia Dignidad in Chile. We are members of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, and uh, we want to give our recognitions to the Institute of the Old National University, and of course, to the effort of the professionals of the coalition. The sites of conscience are diverse, but they have in common the possibility of addressing issues that the society is silent. It's a long story, but um, I'm going to start here. At the beginning of the 20th century, Latin America had more than 700,000 citizens who recognized themselves as German. They had maintained contact with Germany through embassies, through travelers. They received support to start small businesses and large ones too. They founded school in which they maintained their language, tradition, and culture. They kept their religion and their cults kept them in German language. They held important positions in the economy and strong ties with politicians. In Chile, many of them entered to the military school. The photographs on display were taken in Buenos Aires and in Chile. So in 1937 in Santiago, they were celebrating the Hitler's uh, birthday. The other one was taken in uh, Argentina in 1938 and they were celebrating the annexation of Austria. So you can see more or less that there were um, national socialist militants. They were German and they belonged to the party in um, in Germany, uh, the blanks is not because they are, were not um, Nazis there, it's because uh, I don't have the, the um, information of that. When the war began, there were grounds for the Nazi state in Germany to consider expansion to, into Latin America. Operation Bolivar, Operation Bolivar was controlled by the German security services, initially collects and transmits information from Latin America to Europe. In 1942, the Chilean station, radio station, collected information but agents located in Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, Mexico, and United States, meaning that there were people 
doing research and investigation for Nazis in Germany. After Nazis were defeated, war criminals, genocides, murderers, racist, coup plotters, received the welcome of their countrymen, national politicians, merchants, right-wing militants, military, those are modern Janaconas. In Latin America, Janaconas were the traitors. Most of them were an active part of German and United States security services. These things could sound a little strange, but those who had been enemies are now friends and did not hesitate to contribute to COPS, advising torture, repression, murder against Latin American men, women, children who refuse to give up their natural resources, who do not want to abandon their territories, Tradition languages, those who seek to live in the fair and egalitarian society and respect Pachamama. By understanding the role of the Nazis in Latin America and the relationship with the ruling elite, we can explain Danielism, the end of the European War in 1945, known as the World War II, the beginning of the Cold War and anti-communism displaced the fight against fascism and Nazism. This allows denial and heritage of war. Well, the guy we have there, you know, uh, I think that sounds a little bit in our minds, but uh, for example, Ralph was the second guy uh, in the final solution. So they were kind of important people. Hmm? Yes. In this national and international context, Colonia Dignidad arose and developed. Chile, like many Latin American countries in the 1960s, had an Eurocentric and colonialist social elite that thought it had natural privileges and that everything would work fine as long as these values were maintained. A suitable place for a mafia sect, child molesters, coup collaborator, and Nazi protection network. This picture is really sad. It is in, in, in the entrance of Colonia Dignidad. This is the first picture they, uh, it was taken. And uh, you can see all those children and all of them were molested, were abused by Paul Schaeffer. And the girls you see there were raped after a long, uh, as the time goes on. And another thing that is really, really hard for me, there were families there. The adults have children, and they accepted that Paul Schaeffer molested them, raped them. I cannot understand that. Some people explain that when a sect, you know, this following, uh, absolutely follow to the, to the leader is kind of blind. It's a terrible thing. Paul Schaeffer formed a private social mission in Seeburg in Germany. This thing started in Germany after the Second World War. And uh, very soon, uh, in, in Germany, they can have these um, churches, you know, by one shepherd, and they, they, they have their own churches, small ones, and uh, that happened there in, in Seaburg. And uh, by the time goes on, the bond prosecutor investigates shepherd for accusation of child abuse. Colonia Dignidad was created with followers of Cheffer and more than 100 kidnapped children. They bought a farm, Colonia Dignidad, it was 16,000 hectares in the 5th and the 7th region in Chile, that is in the south of Chile. The colony grew to about 300 members. There were family, the families were separated, men on one side, women on another side, Children lived in different houses. They could not recognize their parents or say mama or papa. All of them were uncles or aunties. 
And uh, children, you know, were separated too, boys and girls, and they, they have a very specific way of repression inside, and they promote the, the aggression between them. So, for example, they were in the obligation to uh, speak about their sins. And then Paul Sheffer in the meeting said, okay, he read the sins of us, uh, one of them and ask the other peers to kick and to punish the guy. So they were victims, but at the same time, they were uh, perpet not perpetrators, but aggressors. So nobody could, um, could have a... Uh, confidence in the other. Well, um, Colonia Dignidad established ties with Nazi arms dealers working for German intelligence, Mertens, one of the guys we saw before, actively participated in the civic military coup in Chile. It was a center of torture and extermination of political prisoners. This is a, okay, yeah. Gerhard Mertens was a paratrooper and member of a special operation during the Nazi regime. Walter Rauf, second intelligence officers, officer in charge of final solution, implemented mobile gas chambers. Hans Rudel, German Air Force pilot and aviator, Nazi hero. Investigations, uh, he, he was a criminal and um, he escaped every time. And uh, he has the complicity of judicial system, politician in Chile and Germany. Uh, in Colonia Dignidad there were experiment with gas. And that was the experience that uh, Mr. That Ralph, you know, uh, provide provided. Mertens provided arms in a in a traffic uh, problem because during the dictatorship in Chile, United States uh, Senator Ted uh, Kennedy promoted a law saying that it couldn't be possible to sell uh, weapons to a criminal like Pinochet. So uh, it happens that um, Mr. Mertens brought uh, armor, uh, weapons to Chile. So they uh, offer very good services to the Junta Militar. Here I, I try to make a little summary of the different uh, crimes to different people and trying to show the complexity of the, of the place because uh, the, the victims have not um, connections among them. Let me see, okay. yeah. Uh, for example, they have crimes committed against German settlers, especially with, ki with children. Kidnapping, sexual abuse, rape, torture, slave labor. When you talk to the, column, to the settlers there, it's so touching when they explain, for example, that they were seven years old, they have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. No, they couldn't uh, have, a, have a proper bath, you know, because they have to be, all her sexual parts has to be covered, and they have to work from the morning to the afternoon. Sometimes they did not, they did not receive water as a punishment and they receive really, really small portions for, to, to eat. And uh, for example, they have to uh, clean uh, a piece of land with their hands. They have to take with their hands, you know, their little hands, pieces of, of stones and clear the place because it's going to be used for agriculture or something like that. It's, it's really touching that, you know. It's, it's, um, at the beginning, I was kind of far from the color, from the colonos, as it's in Spanish, because you say, I, they knew things about my friends, you know, they knew things about that. But uh, they do not have, for example, any possibility to understand about the, the time, how the time goes on. <clears throat> well, we have questions and doubts about the people, the denialism, this is, people cannot believe. How is it possible? No, I can't believe that it is so many crimes in a small place. Nazis did not exist anymore. It's not possible. 
well, it was possible. So, here we are. What can we do with this? What do we do? You know, how, where, when? How? Well, we use all of those things, fiction, photos, documentary, survivor testimony, and you can read the list there. We use whatever we have. Where? Whatever we can. <laughs> in, in, in schools, in universities, in the square, in the street, everywhere. Everywhere we are there, we are our testimony, we are our, uh, with our um, uh, exhibition and things like that. We use uh, fiction films, um, and uh, sometimes we have some problems with that. One of the most important fiction films was uh, uh, the actresses, um, a girl who worked with uh, um, Harry Potter thing, and when, once a child asked me Harry Potter was coming to save, you know, the people from Colonia Dignidad, and I said, no, 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 it's not all right, <laughs> so things like that. You know, so on, on one hand, it's uh, open, open doors to talk, and on the other hand, it's closed because it's this uh, magic thinking there, right? Uh, documentaries, there are a lot of documentaries. Netflix, for example, you can find documentaries, and uh, we exhibit the documentaries, and after that, we have a dialogue, but the problem is that uh, people are so chalk that it's very difficult to talk to them. Survivor's testimony. This is something very touching. We have five survivors in our organization, and um, uh, they, they have uh, this possibility to talk to them, to talk to the students, to talk to the people, and uh, they can talk about uh, Danielism, and they can talk, uh, they can talk about um, stereotypes, you know, prejudice, which is nice and good. And this is our main tool. This is an exhibition. Uh, this exhibition, we can move everywhere, as I told you, in the squares, everywhere. And uh, we have a methodology to work with that when we are in connection with the school, that we prepare, we train and prepare students that, uh, <laughs> I'm going to finish it, uh, prepare uh, students that they are going to be the guide of their own peers. So that is very, very important tool that we use. And finally, um, yep. oh, no. Before I say, come on. <laughs> there are some aspects that we have to take in account. Uh, we have to decide with the teachers and students who participate in the training of guys, prepare the visit and the other student to the exhibition, find out about the characteristic of the young people with whom we are going to work and define the objectives of the event, Consider the time available and material that can be used. Link what happened in Colonia Dignidad with current events. Build empathy with victims as if they have family members who are victims of violence. We always ask that. Ask what they know about the Second World War, about the Nazis and dictatorship. And uh, we ask, is it possible to have Nazis here in Chile? And all of them say no, but they are. Well, we hope that this exchange strengthens our side of conscience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That was great. A couple, I think, important reminders from there. One, as we talk about engaging young people, I think it's also really important to remember uh, that in many of these circumstances we're talking about, young people are victims as well. So we're not just talking about this generation, but we're talking about an early generation. And I totally appreciate that you are everywhere. You are not just at the site, but you're in the streets, in the squares. That is incredibly important. So our, so our final side of conscience uh, speaker is Benjamin Sarusi from Casa do Povo in Brazil. When I asked him about a place that could be a site of conscience, he talked about what's called the Black Earth in Brazil, which is as a process of rethinking the Amazon, which is always undergoing exploitation and taking away from indigenous people. Again, a sense that we need to be rethinking about the lands we live on 
and our responsibility is to the original inhabitants and those people. So Benjamin, I'm going to have you introduce you and have you get started. Hi, thank you. I'm the last one. That's terrible. <laughs> anyway, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll make it. Uh, I hope you don't sleep. If you want anyone to grab some coffee, uh, I'm going to be quick. I have my 15 minutes, and I'm going to stick to it. Um, so i um, very happy to be here with you. And it was really thrilling to hear um, the other speakers. I'm, I'm happy after we start the debate. It will be really exciting. Uh, and I thought uh, I would show some images. Uh, no text, just some images. I think it's more catchy to get your attention at this end of this quite intense day. And this is Casa do Povo. Uh, Casa do Povo. Uh, so you can get an idea of the building. Uh, it's a five-story building uh, in downtown Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. Uh, so I'm going to have like a quick um, three-pronged approach. Uh, I'm going to talk about the need to remember now. Uh, it's something that's going through uh, old presentations, which is the fact that we need to look at the past from a perspective that talks about the present times, and I think that's obviously really relevant. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a fundamental event in Kazupovo, uh, which is the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 and how we deal with that on current times. Then I'll talk about uh, revisionism. I'll, I prefer the term denialism, as we talked about. Uh, so where the monsters live and how we deal with that today in Brazil uh, through a series of alliances that we can develop and create uh, on the ground. And the third part is about the need to remember together, so to think about remembering as a collective act. Uh, I call my presentation to remember is to act, and you're going to understand uh, why uh, in the upcoming uh, images. Uh, Casa do Povo was uh, announced in 1946, so I'm going to use this first part to give you a bit some context about um, where I'm talking from. And uh, on this image, you can see the people gathered on the land on which Casa do Povo was built afterwards. So this picture is from 1946, and the picture on the right is from 1953, when the building actually is almost ready to open. And you can't read from here, but it's written in Yiddish on, on, on the panel. Uh, Gedenk, Gedenk Maidanek, Gedenk Auschwitz, Gedenk Dachau, uh, for German speakers or Yiddish speakers, Gedenk is to remember. Uh, and the famous number six million, uh, which has been coined as the number of, of Jews killed uh, in concentration camp during the Second World War. So Kazupovo is, is totally built uh, as a place to remember. Uh, and, uh, but in a very interesting way, I, I believe, is that it's an empty space. Uh, in fact, at the origin of Kazupovo, there are two trends that come together. On the one side, the idea to build a place to pay an homage to those who died in the Second World War. Uh, and on the other side, to bring together all the anti-fascist associations that the Jewish community in Sao Paulo created in the 40s, 30s and 40s, to fight fascism through arts and culture. Uh, and this is like two different origins, right? Uh, the need to build a place to remember, and there was a need to just bring together different associations that had to reinvent themselves since fascism was considered as defeated in 1945. Uh, and it's interesting that these two different narratives, to bring together associations and to remember those who died, come together in one single building. We usually say it's a living monument because it's an empty space. There's nothing to see. When people come and visit us, I always tell them, well, there's nothing to see. And I think it's quite exciting, especially because I work with visual arts and, and I'm kind of tired of the exhibition model uh, that's always used in order to kind of uh, show, explain uh, uh, what's the sites of conscience. So we are challenged uh, all day uh, to try and tell our history uh, in a different way using other devices than exhibition uh, um, uh, display. Um, so that's 953, the inauguration. So all this crowd, right? Hundreds of people uh, who went through the war, so they know what they're talking about, uh, building up this space. And that's when I got in in 2012. So it's the same floor. 
uh, I know how so many people can fit in such a floor. I don't know uh, if people were just smaller, uh, but it's like really packed back then. Uh, and and, and that the, the, same, the same floor. And what's interesting for me is, okay, so what does it mean to remember if the people who build the space, uh, most of them are just dead? So how, how can we inherit uh, uh, this, uh, this, this um, uh, uh, need to remember, right? Uh, how we can work through this history that we ourselves didn't go through, right? Um, so uh, the, the, the Warsaw Ghetto is, is really the, the seminal, the most important, uh, let's say, founding event for Kazupovo. Uh, this image uh, is from the, the, the leaflet that was released in January 1946, announcing the creation of Kazupovo. And what you see on the image on the left-hand side is a representation of the heroes of the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. And, and on the right-hand side, an article by a guy called Bernardo Sable, uh, saying that this is how they commemorated, celebrated victory. They are the founding fathers of Casa do Povo, and I'm saying fathers because they, in Portuguese, is masculine. Uh, and uh, the victory is the end of the war, which is already interesting. We're not talking about the atrocities. We're talking about the fact that we won the war, which is already something quite strange when you talk about sites of consciousness, you usually deal with the trauma. An artist called Yael Bartana, uh, uh, an important Israeli artist based in Berlin, uh, took this sentence and changed the gender and the, and the tense. So instead of this is how they, masculine, celebrated victory, it became this is how they, feminine, celebrate victory. And so people just come back. It looks like a caption for an image that's not there when you walk in the street. Because people don't know who is this they, what victory we're talking about, but they walk around the building and they see this neon uh, uh, light up all night long. And it was interesting for us because it was also a way to look critically at our own history where we realized that women had been erased from. Uh, but that's already to give you a hint about how we kind of deal also with this history, with this uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto in a critical way with ourselves. Uh, but coming back to the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto, every year we have this coming together of the community. Uh, we have a Yiddish choir that sings uh, 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 never say uh, that this is your last path, which is the famous hymn of the partisans that Yiddish community, progressive Yiddish community sing all over the world. Uh, but what's interesting that every year we try to update uh, uh, this memory, uh, uh, with the understanding that every year the Warsaw Ghetto has to, f to, to uprise again. What does that mean? And so we have to look into other uprising happening now. And uh, this year we invited people from black movement, Af uh, uh, African Brazilian movements, uh, to light some of the six candles in homage of the six million dead. And we ask an artist to make, a, a, as we do every year, to make a poster about the uprising of the ghetto. Uh, of course, he took the word Warsaw away from the poster, which is quite relevant because it connects other understanding of what is a ghetto. And we still sing the hymn of the partisan in Yiddish. And we invite someone to talk about the current uprising, in this case, about the African-Brazilian uh, uprising since uh, there's a, um, a genocide going on uh, regarding the, 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 the black youth in, in, in Brazil. Um, and often when we do these kind of things, people say, oh, but that's comparing, that might be trivializing, etc. We don't think so. We think that on the contrary, uh, we're not banalizing, can you say that in English? Uh, trivializing the memory of the Holocaust. On the contrary, we think we're updating it. And if we're saying never more, never again, it's not never again for the Jewish people, it's never again. Uh, so how can we deal with that uh, in, in, in a, a broader way, right? If it's a crime against humanity, it's not a crime against the Jewish people. Uh, so that's my second part about denialism, because if we are comparing, uh, if we are trying uh, um, to, to bring together other understanding of, of this uh, 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 violence that was the Holocaust and the echo that is on today, we have uh, to understand who are those who are now being denied, right? Who are those who are now suffering from revisionism, right? Uh, 
Uh, and that's a beautiful, very small article uh, by uh, Deborah Danowski. Uh, she's a, a Brazilian scholar, a metaphysician, but very much engaged in uh, especially uh, um, uh, environment uh, uh, struggle. And, and, and Deborah made this small uh, a conference that became a very small book, like it's really 20 pages book. Uh, you can go on the internet and like Google translate it. And I poorly translated uh, uh, one excerpt, which when she says, for decades the world has wondered how the Germans under Nazism could not react to an ever increasing arbitrariness, truculence, and injustice that culminated in the Holocaust. Now we know firsthand how to do what they did because we are facing other kinds of denialism regarding climate change, uh, regarding the uh, black youth genocide in Brazil, regarding First Nations, regarding the history of dictatorship uh, in Chile, in Brazil, and elsewhere. So what do we do is we connect to those groups. And so since we have no fixed exhibition, we connect to all those groups. So we connect to the landless movement, who's fighting for the agrarian reform in Brazil, and we sell fruit and vegetables coming from the landless movement. Uh, we connect to the Free Pass movement, a group of youth that brought millions of people in the streets in 2013, and that used Kazupovo as a place to meet and organize themselves politically. And that's an exhibition within 2018 around their archive. Uh, we connect to also uh, the Guarani MBA, which is a nation that lives in the city of Sao Paulo and has a land in the rural area of the city of Sao Paulo. And we work with them uh, every year on different kind of projects. On this one, Jera Guarani, a leader from the extreme south of the city of Sao Paulo, is talking about the retaking of the Guarani corn, which is very essential to their traditions, uh, and the retaking of their lands, which they have been denied access. Uh, we're working with, uh, uh, Leila talked about the penguins in Chile, we had our own penguins in 2015, students that occupied their school to avoid uh, um, uh, them to, to be shut down by the government. And we invited them to work together with a, a, a theater director and they made a performance uh, that became a play that toured the whole world. Uh, it went to France, to England, to Germany. Uh, we also are home to a collective uh, more focused on the LGBTQIA plus uh, movement. Uh, and it might sound like a, a uh, I would say, uh, a political correctness catalog of activities, but I don't think so. I think that what we're doing here is really bingled up alliances with those who are suffering uh, today. Because it's always easy to pinpoint at the extreme right when it happened 70 years ago. Uh, when it's going on right now, people suddenly say, oh, but it's different, right? And even within the Jewish community in Sao Paulo, we're fighting a lot because some people are supporting Bolsonaro, who's an extreme right-wing leader. And they find reasons to support that guy. Uh, and of course, they're all anti-Nazi, and but they say, oh, but you know, uh, uh, he's also doing good things, as uh, uh, people said early on. So that's very interesting to, to look into that. And to end, this third part will be quite quick. It's just a very concrete example of uh, how to activate this history that we inherited uh, when we are cut from it, uh, which I think is also another challenge that we have. Uh, I always feel that I have a, 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 a hair of a kind of a story that happened and I have to activate as the director of a space, but I always feel that I'm also an imposter. Uh, uh, that I'm doing something I'm not sure that those who created the space back then who are now dead would do if they were here. So it's always important to be aware of this thin line you're working on. And that's a good example because the newspaper, that's what's called Unsere Stimme, our voice in Yiddish, and it was created in 1948. It was shut down by dictatorship in 64, and we relaunched it in 2014 for the 50th anniversary of the coup. Uh, but how to relaunch a newspaper that was shut down for 50 years. So we bring people from the community around the table to talk about maybe the need for a new mouthpiece, a new newspaper. And we relaunched it with a new design, obviously, introducing other languages than Yiddish, like Korean, because we have a lot of Korean migrants living in our neighborhood in Borichiro. I just I wanted to show some of the projects we did, because as any newspaper, what we decided to do with this 
uh, committee is to create the news, right? That's what newspapers do. So we did actions in the neighborhood that became news for the newspaper, and those who participate to the actions become an audience because they want to read about what happened, right? So with one single newspaper, we created the news and the audience. Am I clear? Is as if we have the people's house, which is a house with no people, and we have to, using the house, create a new people for the house. You following me? Uh, so we had all this kind of uh, performance happening in the neighborhood. On the left-hand side, I just saw that for our, our Korean host, it would be nice to have this picture about the traditional tea ceremony. It was a transla translation workshop around the word jitta, which is very difficult to translate because it means to cook, to build, and also all different things. You correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, but other kinds of performance. But the most exciting one, I think, was this one called chala which is a Bolivian typical performance that happens on Friday night in Bolivia once a month. Uh, I'm aware I'm finished. I'm concluding two minutes. Can you give me that, Linda? One minute. Thank you. Uh, and this chayla ceremony is something that people do in Bolivia, and we have a lot of Bolivians in the neighborhood, to uh, 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 renew agreements for love, for business, through donation to Pachamama, Mother Earth. And an artist called Bernardo Zabalaga said, look, Casdu Povo is looking a bit on the downside. Uh, the energy is low, so, but I can help you to, to bring it up. It's a very simple way. Uh, just do a chala and reconnect with the dead. And so we made the chala. So we use the Bolivian ceremony through an art performance to reconnect with our dead. So the director made, the president made a speech, and then Bernardo went around the building with uh, throwing smoke all over the place. Uh, to kind of uh, reconnect with Pachamama. And at the end of the day, what was interesting about this chala is that we created the community. And that's the way I wanted to end, to say that at the end of the day, when we remember together, we're also talking about community building. Uh, and we invent new pedagogies, uh, new way of teaching and dealing with memory uh, uh, using other kinds of format. And in this case, it was just a performance and suddenly, it's not about having a Jewish audience or a Bolivian audience or a Korean audience. It's about having a people in becoming and about passing over a history which is close to my chest to other people as it was passed from another generation to my generation. So it's about us always being erroristas, which I think, and that's how I conclude, uh, uh, which is this banner we put on the, on the front of Casa do Povo a couple of years ago from an Argentine collective called Etc. And they say that what will change the world is not terror, but it's error. So they are not terrorista, they are errorista. And I think we're all errorista trying to find our way in between revisionism, denialism, and talking to new generation and new groups in order to bring forward uh, 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 our agenda. So thank you very much. I have this newspaper for you guys, if someone wants to look. It's the last edition. Sorry, Linda. Hello, everybody. Yeah, may I have your attention? Because uh, we are really going to uh, call it a day. And uh, let me start uh, with some summary of our seminar today. Can I? Yeah, OK. Um, our Rapata, where's Gulem? Where's Gulem? Oh, Gulem is over there, yeah. Our rapporteur, uh, Gulem, from ICSC, uh, summarized beautifully uh, concerning today's discussion. So let me share uh, those writings with you. But music is still going on, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I should read, you know, it's like a release, like, right, like a song, yeah. Um, there are several key points. And uh, first of all, the most important thing is about the historical revisionism. Historical revisionism manipulates historical facts and spread misinformation that perpetuate bias and discrimination and has been emerging uh, aided by new media and communication technologies. In order to counter this kind of historical revisionism, we need to listen to underrepresented uh, voices and we must place the young generation at the center of the debate to ensure uh, that the memories we have worked so hard so far to preserve can be maintained by future generation continuously. 
And uh, there are challenges to conventional World War II narratives at heritage sites have emerged, some of the, uh, which include under uh, representative voices and experiences related to the war that can enrich our understanding of this history, as well as others that manipulate uh, historical facts and spread disinformation that perpetuate bias and discrimination and en enables violence and further violations of human rights. There are some insights uh, concerning the uh, current international debates, I think mainly mentioned by Zhang Lui. Uh, currently, UNESCO Working Group is examining the difficulties in dealing with sites of memory inscribed in the World Heritage List or nominated for inscription. Uh, within the current framework of the World Heritage Convention, unfortunately, there are severe uh, limitations and many sites of memory could not meet the current requirements uh, for inscription. However, the convention is working on and uh, expected to propose and promote guidelines and st standard for recognition of site memory that could be references for uh, the other you know, sites in general. Uh, the community dialogue was very much emphasized during the discussion as well. In post-conflict societies, particularly those uh, with history of repression and silencing, community engagement and participation allow multiple stakeholders to feel that their views and opinions are important and that their voices are being heard. It allows for dialogues and discussion and contributes toward the process of rebuilding trust and community building since it gives a diversity of st stakeholders a sense of working toward a common goal. And there, the meanings of sites of conscious. As we have seen in today's case studies, sites of conscious are perfectly positioned to spark community dialogue that amplifies marginalized voices, accesses the uh, damaging strands of revisionism, and promotes truth telling revelating the lessons of the past to foster free, just, and democratic societies. By recognizing all victims of the conflict and engendering new understandings of shared values across diverse audience and through time, side of conscious contributes to a deeper understanding of history and its contemporary legacies. And those sites, Work, uh, work as inclusive spaces reflecting a full range of voices, perspectives, and experiences. By making space to this complexity, in inclusivity, and engagement, those sites can help counter simplified narratives that often ignore inconvenient facts or evidence, prioritizing or promoting the le legitimacy of influencer actors and help produce more and better opportunities for building peace and preventing violences. And last but not least, uh, one of the most important focus uh, is youth participation. Today we learned that youth and young generations need to sit at the table when discussing sustainable peace. The challenges for most society is how to ensure that the younger generations who did not live through the events being commemorated, incorporate or transform their significance. To make sure we place the young generations at the center of the debate, we must have a strong educational focus with ample opportunities for youth to critically engage and participate in the activities carried out at the site. In engaging new generations in human rights discourses, Sites of memory and heritage sites help prevent future uh, atrocities. So those are the uh, summaries of the today's debate and discussion and presentations. I hope uh, this included many parts of the uh, speeches today. Uh, but of course, we are very welcome to accommodate um, further revisions. And uh, please send us emails. And uh, you can leave some comments on our SNS platforms, if, of course. Uh, since time is limited, I think I need to invite those two representatives, uh, today's seminar's host, 
Professor Joe first and then Linda later on uh, to give some words uh, of closing. Professor Joe, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again. I know it is my third appearance in podium, so if you are tired of my remarks, I do not blame you. So I'm going to make it very short. So while listening to today's discussion, I found there are several similarities among us. At least, we have the gut to face with dark history of our own. So we are not evaders. So we are willing to hear other voices. I have a hunch that this meeting will be a starting point for change. So I am grateful for all participants. You have brought invaluable insight to this conference, especially young participants have made this seminar become an opportunity for intergeneration dialogue. I'd like to mention we, uh, we all are indebted to step members of coalition and SNU side. They are the real one who made this seminar productive and engaging. Let's give them big hands first. Okay, let's explore more opportunities to develop today's discussion and exchange further. We'll meet somewhere and someday with more fascinating stories and fascinating ideas. Let's find ways to deepen this intergeneration dialogue. So let me give the last ball. Let me, uh, let me pass the last ball to Ms. Linda Norris. She's going to give a very short closing remark. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I want to join Dr. Joe in thanking all of those who did so much work in organizing this meeting, both in person and, uh, and online. Um, I approach my closing remarks very much as a practitioner. I'm not a theorist, I'm a practitioner. Although the circumstances are so different that we've heard today from all over the world, I, my takeaway was several things. One, that dialogue, as Jihan, men Jihan mentioned, Dialogue is critical to this work. It's critical to all of the work of Sites of Conscience, but I think it's critical to, in a broader way as well. But I also think, even though the models around the world are really different, that there are perhaps three things that are helpful to us as we move forward in this work. First, a willingness to rethink and revise, which is different than revisionism. The German example was very inspiring to me that our work of understanding um, what our sites tell us, what the history tell us, is ongoing work. That work is never done. Um, I think a second critic, and that should include the youth in those conversations, a second critical element is a willingness to bring curiosity and experimentation to our conversations about these sites. I'd say Casa de Povo uh, gave us kind of incredible examples about that. And lastly is the idea that a passionate commitment to this work, whatever the work is, whatever story you're telling, whatever narratives that have been forgotten you're trying to bring forward, that passionate commitment to work and to community action needs to happen in every circumstance. If it's just a government, it won't work. If it's just you on your own, it's probably not gonna work. But that passionate collective commitment that we heard from so many places today is critical. So those are my three practitioner takeaways. Um, and again, um, thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Linda. You gave us some homework to do, right? <laughs> Well, actually, um, when I listened to your closing remarks, I, there was a one word that really uh, stayed in my mind today, today, whole session. Uh, I think it is from uh, the one, uh, one of the presentations from Italy about the responsibility. Yeah, I thought that it's our responsibility to talk about this issue continuously, and so that we can, you know, maybe encourage, yeah, those future generation to talk about this continuously as well so that we can find out solution concerning these difficult you know, questions. So uh, this is it for today's seminar. It was a long day, but I really appreciate your participation in person, you know, in person participants here and also online participants. 
And um, you know, in particular, uh, during the COVID-19, we couldn't have this kind of events for a long time, but we made it this time. Uh, and uh, some of you know, some of the speakers came to uh, came to you after like 60, uh, 16 hours of flight, which is amazing. So I do appreciate your kind participation and contribution. And thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you to all the staffs at the museum.